The presentation will explain the four stages in the development of friendship and provide you with strategies to encourage the de development of friendship skills, social integration from children as young as three to young adults. But before we start, of course, there's some housekeeping things. So turn those mobile phones off or onto silent. The toilets are um, located at the entry door. And while, of course, this is a free GMHBA funded event, uh, we can't cover your public transport or parking costs and uh, I wouldn't want any of you to get some fines, so I hope that you have all um, put your uh, metres on and got the tickets there. You've also noticed that there's a survey document on your chair and it's really important for us as the DMHBA health team to shape future seminars, so if you could fill them out, um, that would be very useful for us and hand them to the team on the way out. For those of you in the audience that are using today as a professional um, development opportunity, please see our lovely GMHBA staff as you leave and they will, from the registration desk, will fill out a certificate of attendance. And hello and welcome to our viewers at home. We are live streaming today's event for people who aren't able to make it and for those who live um, in other parts of the country and down in the Bowen Southwestern region. And we are so very glad that you can join us. I know that many of you will have questions, um, and if you could save them to the end of Tony's presentation when we will open the floor for question time. Those of you at home can send the questions on the GMHBA Facebook page or the Twitter using the hashtag GMHBA. And of course, Tony, Tony won't be able to answer all of your questions, um, so feel free to post them, and he has um, kindly offered that he will follow up in the next couple of weeks and respond to some of those questions. We've also invited a whole lot of local providers, service providers, to attend the event today, and you are most welcome. Please take the time to talk with them during the breaks and at the end of the sessions, and they may be able to help you and assist you and your family, or queries that you might have. We're also very grateful to the help we received in developing this <coughs> seminar with Gateway Support Service. Gateway is a responsive community organisation that empowers and supports children and adults with disability or who have additional needs in the Western Victoria. So today we do invite you to perhaps do a gold coin donation to Gateways in the collection tins provided. And this money will help specifically help their fantastic recreation program, which is with young people with autism. <coughs> so a little bit about GMHBA, and I'm sure you know that we're a regionally based health insurer fund. Um, but we have more recently moved into developing quite a lot of health services and direct health service care. You might well have seen our eye care services. Um, we do a lot of um, work with chronic disease management and supporting other community endeavours with community grants and a whole lot of community engagement as well as our health insurance and our health services. Um, this is the 13th seminar that we've held and the health seminars are very important um, to GMHBA. Tony um, came to us last year and spoke on auto autism and uh, the response was so great that we invited him back again this year and we've had over 1,200 or so attendees today and that's fantastic. We offer these sem uh, seminars to members and non-members locally because we believe that education and information is key to building healthy communities. We've always had a very special connection as a, um, a local Geelong-based. We actually um, started and been here since 1934, and that's quite significant. And more recently, as I said, we've been developing health services. So it's very important for us in terms of building stronger communities, supporting education, um, seminars, um, to create sustainable, healthy and well-being for communities. But I'm very honoured, as I said, to um, introduce our guest speaker today and a little bit about who is Professor Tony Atwood. Yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> he said, be kind. But I do want to um, say a few things. It's like very important, I think, to place a context and to know that we have um, a terrific expert here in our midst. Tony is a clinical psychologist who has specialised in autism spectrum disorders since he qualified as a clinical psychologist in England. Do you want me to tell the date? <laughs> In 1975, <laughs> he currently yeah, uh, works in his own yeah, yeah, private... I, I, I want to encourage positive ageing. Because <laughs> there's nothing I can do to stop it. So I might as well embrace it. Um, I think that's actually an interesting area in autism, to embrace it. And in a way, that's what I'm going to focus on today. But anyway, sorry, yeah. <laughs> he currently works in his own private practice and also is adjunct professor at Griffith University in Queensland, a senior consultant at the Minds and Hearts Clinic. What a great name. Minds and Heart Clinic in Brisbane. His book, Asperger's Syndrome, a guide for parents and professionals, has sold over 350,000 copies and has been translated into over 25 languages. His subsequent book, The Complete Guide to Asperger's Syndrome, was published in October 2006 and is one of the primary textbooks on Asperger's Syndrome. 
his several, several subsequent books published by Jessica Kingley Publishers, Future Horizons and Guildford Press. Um, he's been invited to be a keynote speaker in many Australasian and international conferences and he presents workshops, runs training courses for parents, professionals and individuals with Asperger's syndrome and all over the world and he's a prolific author of scientific papers, books on the subject. Very busy man. He's worked with thousands of individuals of all ages with Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum disorder and we welcome and I'm sure that you will enjoy today. Also got the afternoon session, it will be quite different, Tony tells yeah. me, to this morning's session and I know some more people will be joining us this afternoon and I hope our online folk um, uh, do participate with the hashtag GMHBA if they've got questions or on the Facebook. So um, please join my hands in welcoming Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the next presentation will be in Dublin, followed by Stockholm and Copenhagen, but today, Geelong. I only go to the major cities of the world. So, yeah, I'm 64, as in the Beatles when I'm 64. And in that time, yes, I qualified in 1975, officially, that's when I began. But actually, it was much younger than that. I phoned my mother in England regularly, uh, and on a Sunday, I was phoning her about two years ago, and in the conversation, my, my mother calls me Anthony, and she said, Anthony, Anthony, I, I just read an article in the Sunday Times magazine about Asperger's syndrome. I said, yes, mother. She said, y y your stepfather, Bernard, who's an engineer that she married when I was six, your stepfather, Bernard, he's Asperger's. To which I said, yes, mother, don't you actually read my books? <laughs> And so, in some ways, I started my exploration of autism spectrum disorders at six years old with my stepfather, who seemed different. And I didn't know I was going to grow up to be a, become a psychologist, but I observed and analysed him and so on. So I described myself as bilingual. I know two cultures, and my role is to pass on the neurotypical world to the person with ASD and the ASD world to the person who's neurotypical. And in a way, when we come to diagnostic assessments, I tend to move away from the term diagnosis to discovery. Van Vincent van Gogh was discovered, not diagnosed. The Beatles were discovered, not diagnosed. And I see ASD as a different way of perceiving, thinking, learning, and relating. But the trouble is they're a minority in a world of social zealots. And what is ASD? It describes in simple terms someone who in life has found something more interesting and enjoyable than socialising. But they happen to be at school with social zealots that prioritise socialising. And you are to be corrected and to become a clone of what we call neurotypicals. But what it means is that those with ASD their brain is wired differently, and it may be that the average ability is here. Their social structures within the brain aren't working as they should, so they're like that. But other areas, mathematics, attention to detail, uh, engineering can be much more advanced. So it's really a question, what do you value in society? The trouble is for those with ASD is they're expected to socialise. So the topic is making friends. Typical kids, you, you don't have to teach them how to make friends. I'll give you an example. I'm a grandfather now. And uh, it's hard work, though, because um, you realise kids should be there when you're younger, when you've got the energy. But our granddaughter, Alice, we are at Noosa, beautiful. It was an evening, and I was there with uh, my two daughters and Alice and so on there. And Alice saw another two girls. Alice is two and a half. The girls were three and four. And they just sort of looked at each other, came in a bit closer, giggled, copied each other, and they're away. And a few moments later, the girl's mother was taking a photograph of them. And they were, Alice is two and a half. And they were all great friends together. How did they do it? But typical kids just know, they're pre-wired to see other kids and just engage. They know the boundaries, they know the style, they know the pace, they know how to make socialising successful. You don't get 
courses in friendship at school. You get foreign languages, you get mathematics, but friendship isn't an actual theme, and yet this is one of their greatest challenges. What I'm going to go through this morning is how to encourage friendship and social relationship skills. That's the positive, the good side. But there's a dark side. And the dark side is whenever I'm dealing with Asperger's, I am not concerned with the person with Asperger's. I am concerned how neurotypicals will destroy their self-esteem by bullying, teasing. Oh, yes, but what can be worse is humiliation and rejection in building self-esteem. And so for many of the teenagers I see with Asperger's, their sense of self is based on the criticism and rejection of peers, not the compliments and acceptance of peers, which has a devastating effect and a major contribution to depression. So this afternoon, I'm going to go through the issue of bullying and teasing, and the vast majority of those with ASD are bullied and teased, and it doesn't end when you graduate from high school. It exists in the workforce. It exists in the family. So all those sort of things can occur. So the theme this morning is making friends. Now, I chose that picture deliberately because that's what it's like for a kid with ASD. Those kids are getting on together, they're fine, but they've all got their back to you. And as an ASD kid, that's how you can feel. There's all this going on, but you're not included. You're poor in the currency of friendship. There's a lot that's happening, and kids enjoy the socialising. But this kid can't use their intuition. They've got to use their intelligence, which means it takes longer, and it's fraught with problems. And one of the things that is a common characteristic of ASD is a pathological fear of making a mistake. And the fear of making a mistake and being rejected and ridiculed in the social group. So sometimes the social isolation is a method of protection because in the group you may be subject to all sorts of bullying, teasing and humiliation. Now, what we're going to do this morning is go through four components. The diagnostic criteria. What do we look for that marks out the social challenges of someone with ASD? We're going to go through social understanding. That is the ability to develop social reasoning, um, to read body language, tone of voice, etc. I'm going to go through the four stages of friendship. And as kids progress, you can teach the kid with ASD, and they've got it, yay! And then the other kids have moved on. It's like a horse race, and everyone else is moving on, and he's trying to, trying to catch up behind, but they're constantly moving. And later on today, uh, four strategies to reduce being bullied and teased. I'll be going through that a little bit later on, because the consequence can be depression. And when I look at adults, because I cover the full age range, the youngest child I've diagnosed was three weeks old, right through to those in their 80s, and... One of the things that we found is 70% of those with ASD have cyclical depression. And the depression occurs for a variety of reasons, but one of them is not fitting in and being welcomed and valued by others. Now, diagnostic criteria. Uh, DSM-5, Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. For those of you who know, there's no statistics in it at all. Why it's called that is debatable. But it's the new diagnostic criteria, May 2013, for autism spectrum disorders. That's the term that we use. Now, when you do the diagnosis, one of the key distinguishing parts of ASD is a problem understanding people. Not animals, not mathematics, not engineering. It's people are your greatest challenge in life. So what you have are described as deficits in social-emotional reciprocity. That's the balance in the interaction. So, if you take an illustration of a group of kids playing over there, kid with ASD here. This is booming a lot. Is it yeah. the sound? It, it is booming. So we may need to... Do I need to move to a different position, or you can just... He knows what he's doing. Good. He's done all this before. Now, reciprocity. Group of kids over there, kid with ASD, 
don't get it, don't understand it, I much prefer Lego. And so he plays with his Lego and turns his back on them and enjoys playing with the Lego. Because if he shares, he loses control. More on that later. So in other words, I can do it my way, because if you share it with another kid, it could end up doing anything. So as far as he's concerned, if they come up, thump them, they go away, that's fine. Because really, you just want to stay by yourself. Don't get it, don't understand. And that's the isolated, introverted, withdrawn, conspicuous because of where they are on the periphery of socialising and doing actions that avoid interaction. But there's a second group in reciprocity, and they do this. Right, OK, you do that, you do that. No, I'm the boss. Uh, I tell the teacher, you do that. No, and they're right in your face. And this isn't the introverted, withdrawn, shy. This is the extroverted, highly motivated, want to interact with other people, but they just don't get it. And as far as they're concerned, they can't understand why they're not popular, they're rejected, etc. But they're intrusive, intense, abrasive, controlling. And so the sense of reciprocity is, for young kids, they take over the role of an adult. And when they're preschoolers, they think like an adult, talk like an adult, want to be treated like an adult, another class policeman correcting the other kids. So as far as they're concerned, I'm an adult, you do this, you do that, etc. But there's a third group, we'll go through this later on, and that's the girls. Not exclusively, some boys can do this. And the girls go... Mm. I don't get it, but uh, I need to find out. Who's popular? Rebecca. What does she like to wear? Oh, OK, I'll get that. She likes pink. I'll get pink. She'll become pink, pink, pink personified. OK, how does Rebecca talk? I'll talk like Rebecca. I want to be called Rebecca. What does she collect? Barbies. I'll get 100 Barbie dolls. <laughs> and so what she does is observe, analyse and imitate. She wears a mask. She becomes the person for the situation. Intellectually, she has a role, a script. By situation, hasn't a clue. But she acts. And as far, oh, and as, far as she's concerned, I fake it till I make it. At school, I'm a goody two-shoes. I am perfect. I am the one who dobs in everyone else. I, am, I will do what the teacher asks, but ha, you wait till she gets home. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, she's suppressed it. She's contained it, but when she gets home, <laughs> she is authoritarian and dismissive and critical, etc. Some of you are nodding and going, yeah, right, OK. Has that described some of the people you know? Yes. And school say, no, no, but she's fine at school. You obviously don't know how to manage her. You wait. <laughs> I'll do on my phone a little video. And not, no, she's not. Yep, she is. Right. So that's reciprocity. It's the balance. Now, the next is deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviours used in social interaction. What it means by that is the ability to read a face. Body language, tone of voice. It's all the signals. I call these kids... Italian drivers. A bit later on this year, I'm off to Milan. Oh, I have been warned, and no, when I say Italian drivers, yes, I've been to Athens and I've been to Paris. Italian drivers are the worst. In Italy, you park wherever you want to park. You, if it's a traffic light, you just go straight through it. You don't notice red traffic lights. And the taxi driver wants an extra tip for the number of red lights he went through for my benefit that are trying to kill me. Anyway, um, they're like Italian drivers. They don't read the signals. Now, as I'm standing here, I need to stand here to look at your faces. Now, for me, your faces are traffic lights. If you smile and nod, green light, I keep talking. If you go, oh, no. amber light, slow down, not speed up, slow down. If you burst into tears, red light, I'd stop. But these kids don't see those signals. They don't see the no tailgating signals and invade your personal body space. They don't see the woman at work signs and keep interrupting you. They don't read the signals. And that means if they don't get a formal diagnosis, they get a moral diagnosis. 
badly brought up, rude, inconsiderate. But I have to explain to the kids, and this is one of the major themes in strategies, is explaining that we have traffic signals to prevent traffic accidents, and we have social signals to prevent social accidents. These are the codes. But interestingly, when I was in Italy, and subject to motorbikes on the pavement, motorbikes on the pavement, right, um, I talk, was talking to a group of Aspie adults, and I said, what's it like having Asperger's in Italy? And they said, hell, absolute hell. I said, why? Oh, whenever you see somebody, they said, we all want to move to Japan. It's just, <laughs> they don't touch you. So I can, I can understand that. I was doing a program the other day of a little Aspie boy. He's about eight. And we were talking about the horrible events in his life. And one was his auntie, who's Italian. She's lovely, but she's like a marshmallow. And she comes in and goes, like this. And, ah, and he goes, ah, and, and hates whenever she's around because she's so demonstrative with her affection. So we had to go through what we call a comic strip conversation, describing the event for him, stick figures and speech and thought bubbles, so that when she's doing that and hugging you, it's because she loves you, she likes you. It's her way of showing affection. I know she smells of perfume. I know she's squishy and you can't breathe because it's so tight. And I know it's far more intense that you're comfortable with. But let's see if we can find another way than saying something rude and pushing her away of that. And also explaining to mum that when you're sister comes in, please tell her, just give him a quick hug, but ask permission first and tell him, I'm going to give you a quick hug because I love you. All you've got to do is give me a quick hug back and then it's done and I'll be really happy. Okay. So it's understand, she understands his culture is Scandinavian <laughs> or Japanese, hers is etc. So it's understanding the two different cultures. So it's reading body language. It's also, another criterion is understanding and developing and maintaining relationships. That initially starts off with friendships. That is to make a friend, and some with ASD can make friends but not keep them. We may go through that in sort of question time and discussion. But they may have talent in art or Lego or something like that, which is appealing to the other kids. They've got a talent but when it comes to maintaining the friendship, their emotional explosions or their, sometimes their need for isolation or expectation that that friend will always be there and support them, not knowing the flexibility that sometimes a friend doesn't want to play with you, um, means that they may lose friends. And many with ASD describe their friendship history as one of betrayal. They made friends, but the friends betrayed them or they went to someone else, and they can't understand why and what was going on. So it may be that it's working on a four-year-old, helping him to interact and play with the peers in the sandpit. But it may also be the 44-year-old who's married with three kids, and it's helping him understand his partner, okay? It's going through. The ultimate in relationship is your partner and understanding when your partner needs attentive listening, not problem solving. She just wants you to listen. And I say to the husbands, look, you, you don't have to solve a problem. All you've got to do is just, you, go, you do, you go, mm, oh, really? Mm. I said, watch women. They do it perfectly. Mm. Oh, re oh, you poor thing. Oh, never mind. Oh, what a shame. Oh, no. Oh, etc. Because I know in engineering you are paid to find solutions. <laughs> she doesn't want a solution. She just wants someone who's compassionate in that situation. Dead easy. But you must look at her and you learn bovine activities. Mmm, 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 mmm. And that's what she needs. Become a cow. Right. Um, 
So it's not only understanding the needs, and I, yesterday, as I was uh, in a car driving from the airport to here, and yesterday afternoon and evening, I was marking someone's PhD thesis. And what she's done is explore couples where, in these relationships, it's the husband who has the Asperger features. And it's the quality of life of that wife. And sense of well-being was lower than you'd expect in relationships. Um, for a variety of reasons we may go through later. But what she also found was that the wives had higher than expected levels of empathy. And a bit later on we'll go through the theme, who falls in love with an Aspie? Because someone must fall in love with an Aspie, otherwise it would have died out years ago. <laughs> so it was really going through those sorts of issues and the support that that person needs, a very valuable research study. But what I'm doing in my clinical work is, yes, I do regularly visit and help the partner support group, which is usually wives whose husbands have Asperger's. But what I am doing now is supporting the typical children and the issues of having an Aspie parent. And how does it affect them? And we'll go through things like, yeah, what, what's good about having an Aspie dad? Oh, look, he knows about everything. You know, if I have homework, he'll know the answer. And then another kid said, yeah. And I want a yes, no. And he takes half an hour to give me a lecture. <laughs> so I don't ask him anymore. Because he just goes on and on and on and on and on, etc. So we go through those sorts of components. So it's helping that person with Asperger's as an adult not only find a relationship but keep a relationship but also a relationship with your children too, because all those are going to be potential issues. So, now, when we look at stages in friendship for the child with ASD, there are five stages of an ASD child. Now, the first stage really isn't a stage of friendship at all. This is a kid, four to six years old, who goes into the playground not to discover the social world of finding his mates and play handball or whatever. Now, he goes into the playground, yes, absolutely, to discover the school's plumbing and drainage system. <laughs> or to find a lizard. Or find ants. Or the shapes of the clouds. And he wants knowledge and information. Not socialising, he's after facts and information. Where do you get facts and information from? Two sources. One is the library. And the library is an Aspie-friendly environment. It's quiet, ordered, structured, non-social, information priority, and the librarian herself is probably Aspie as well. <laughs> because many Aspies I see are keen on cataloguing and librarianship because of the value of knowledge. So the other way you get knowledge is not from children your age, because children your age are boring and stupid. And I often find, especially with the teenagers with Asperger's, sometimes their interests are adult level. Opera, for example. Or they're interested in astrophysics and things like that. Sometimes, although they're chronologically 14, 15, some aspects of them are in their 20s. Some aspects are till three and four years old. It's the discrepancy between the level of functioning. So they go to adults because adults know things. Adults will explain. Adults can give you information as to why the clouds are that shape, etc. So if you're going to relate to anyone, it's an adult because they tend to be calmer, more accommodating. They'll answer your questions, etc. So as far as this kid is concerned, I'm interested in the physical world, what knowledge can I find, kids my age, boring and stupid. However, when the kids are six, seven, eight years old, they realise that other kids are, are having fun, enjoying each other, and there's something special going on here, and they seem to be enjoying it. So the kid goes, OK, uh, I'll have a go. I'll join in. But he's seven. And developmentally and social understanding, because of lack of experience and neurology, he's two to three years behind his peer group. 
So for the peer group to accept him, they've got to adjust and download, downplay, sorry, and lower the level of interaction in the game to accommodate his naivety, lack of complexity in the social game. Not every kid is going to be prepared to do that. And so this kid may decide for the first time to create a bridge between himself and other kids. But as he crosses that bridge, he may not be welcome on the other side. Because of his naivety, his bossiness, all those sorts of components means that he may well be rejected. Now when he's rejected, there's another factor coming in. And that is from about six to eight years old. The nature of difference for typical kids changes. Up to that stage, difference between kids is gender or race. The major obvious differences. Now, differences are in personality, interests, ability. There's a much deeper and more complex decision of who you want to be with that matches your evolving personality. And the kids with ASD often miss out, and they know it. And at that age, they come home and say, why don't I get invited to birthday parties? All the other kids do. I've never been invited to a birthday party. All the other kids, when I go to join them and I try to join in, they look at me as though I'm stupid. And they start to feel different. And when they start to feel different, there's one of four psychological reactions. Two internalizing, two externalizing. One internalizing reaction to the recognition you're different is low self-esteem and depression. So a kid as young as seven or eight years old feels inferior, defective. And once that starts to become his belief and mindset, he will look for evidence to confirm that. And so as far as he's concerned, I'm defective, nobody likes me, nobody... And he's seven, eight years old. So low self-esteem and depression. Another internalizing reaction is not depression, but if you're not valued by your peer group, you're poor in the currency of friendship, and they, kids don't seem to like you and so on, that's okay, because you're good at imagination, and you'd create an imaginary world. Dinosaurs, no school, no people. Island of Sodor, the engines. You become fascinated by a number of components of alternative worlds. It may be history, ancient Egypt or Rome, where you could live and be successful. It may be another country, Japan, with anime and manga, and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! Another world where I will be valued and accepted. It may be another universe. It may be Star Wars and Star Trek. But you don't feel valued here. You're interested in transport to get you out of here. And as far as you're concerned, you escape into imagination. And sometimes that imagination is so good you have imaginary friends. And if you're four, five, six years old talking to your imaginary friends, that's cute. But if you're 16 talking to imaginary friends, people think you're psychotic. A little while ago, I saw a girl of 12. Seen her before, and her mum phoned up, said, Tony, could you see her? She's developing puberty and schizophrenia. And I said, I understand the puberty bit, but why, why schizophrenia? She's hallucinating. How do you mean she's hallucinating? In class and in the playground and at home, she talks aloud to someone called Sarah. Sarah doesn't exist. It's a blank space. But she talks to her aloud. And it's a pure hallucination. Sarah does not exist. But she sees her. Schizophrenia. So I thought, I'll see her as soon as I can. <coughs> and I did. And I said to her, when you're with Sarah... What sort of things do you talk about? Oh, well, uh, we talk about the new school principal and, and our favourite TV shows, and, and we talk about our homework and what we're going to do for our homework. And I turned to Mum and said, that's not schizophrenia. That's loneliness. Plus, Aspie, she wasn't aware of how other people will view her escape into imagination and talking aloud to someone who's not there. She was in a bubble. And in that bubble of imagination, she was fantastic. Now, that may be such a fantastic imagination that you grow up to become an author, scriptwriter, etc. 
because to cope, you've always escaped into imagination. And when you're an author of fiction, you're in control of characters and you explore aspects of your life and you're a great observer of people. And so that imitation, sorry, that um, imagination can be a remarkable way of finding an alternative world. It's not psychotic. It's a good imagination. Now, that's an internalizing one. You're then diagnosed with attention deficit disorder because you're off with the fairies. And you've missed what the teacher's saying because your inner imagination is much more exciting than reality. The externalizing, remember I said depression is low self-esteem. For those who have high IQ, they'll do the opposite or can do the opposite. Not low self-esteem, arrogance, omnipotence, narcissistic personality disorder. I am superior to other people. It's what I call the Sherlock syndrome. And because Sherlock can't understand emotions, he dismisses them as irrelevant. But it's because he can't understand them, but he understands everything else. And because he's smart but can't understand it, then it's no use. But you get someone who sees themselves as superior to other people. In the TV, not TV series, uh, film on Alan Turing, the imitation game, Alan Turing was a mathematician who was at Bletchley Park in the Second World War cracking the Nazi Enigma code. And there was a film of him and his life story. His knowledge of mathematics is fantastic. Those with Asperger's are often very good at maths. What is maths? It's trying to discover patterns. And those with ASD are always trying to discover patterns and break in patterns. And that's what maths is. It's exploring patterns. He was talented, but bullied and teased mercilessly at his British boarding school. He has a friend, Christopher, unfortunately, who died. But he's talking to Christopher and says, I'm bullied and teased because I'm smarter than they are. And Christopher says, no, it's not because you're smarter. It's because you're different. That's why they target you. So you've got someone who self-comforts by the belief that they are superior to other people, and that won't get you many friends when you keep pointing out their errors because it makes you feel good. Because for these kids, if you're not good socially and you're not good at sport, all you've got is your intelligence, and you value that very highly. And to be called stupid is one of the worst insults but more on that later. So, that's the externalizing arrogance. But there's another externalizing, which I described earlier, which the boys can do, but sometimes, well, sorry, the girls can do, but sometimes the boys, and that is observation, analysis, and imitation. And you learn to imitate. Now, that's fine in primary school, but it's getting too complicated by the time you get to high school. And this is one of the reasons why boys with ASD are diagnosed preschool, primary school. Girls with Asperger's tend to be diagnosed at high school onwards, where to metaphorically the wheels fall off. And she develops anxiety disorder, selective mutism, anorexia nervosa, borderline personality disorder, a whole range of things that people think are going on. When you do a developmental history, you realize she's had challenges socially from preschool years. But she faked it. She observed. She analyzed. She made it successful. She imitated. She imitates accents and movements. She learns foreign languages and speaks that language without her native accent. She's phenomenal. And then she wins an Oscar. Yes. Remember I said imagination and imitation? Hollywood has more Aspies than Microsoft. Yes, because that may be their career. So it's wanting to have friends and then realizing I'm not good at it, I don't fit in, I'm not valued. It's either depression, imagination, arrogance, or imitation. Now a bit later on, when they're probably... 9, 10, 11 years old. Friendship, yeah, it's, it, it is realistic. Uh, there was a mum I was helping with her son develop friendship through all these years, and now he's about nine years old. And she comes into the clinic, and she says, guess what? I say, no. Yep, he's got three friends. No. Three? How can you do it? 
Well, the school playground is the solar system of socialising. You have the sun and the inner planets all around each other in the playground. And he's Pluto, planetoid, on the outer. With his Pokemon cards. And he literally bumped into another kid with Pokemon cards. And, oh, you got this and I got this. And they spoke Pokemon to each other. And they bumped into another two kids with Pokemon cards. And the mum said, oh, by the way, Tony, the Minds and Hearts Clinic is going to have another three referrals. <laughs> because they found each other. This is the Anime and Manga Society. <laughs> the chess club. The Lego group. And so the nature of friendship is based on the shared interests. And that's one of the common characteristics of friendship, is someone of the same culture, thinking, etc. And their view of a conversation, because in ASD, the point of a conversation is to exchange information. If there's no information to exchange, why waste time talking? Remember that with your partner. Now, OK, they phone each other, they go, right, have you got card number 42? No, OK, right, put the phone down. Right, because you don't ask about his dead grandma or his new puppy, because that's irrelevant. You want to know, has he got that card? If not, that's it. End of conversation. Far more important things to do than social chit-chat. Waste of time. So they're functional friends. They're based on the interest. And it, the ASD kid will choose an interest that matches him, not because it's cool and trendy. If it happens to match what other kids are interested in, that's where Pokemon was so famous, still going today. Um, that was great because that's what you were interested in. But it's in the teenage years at high school that can be an intense loneliness. And when I talked to the teenagers about their loneliness, they said, well, the implication is, if you are marooned on a desert island, Robinson Crusoe, on your own, you can cope with it because there's no one there. I mean, you have to get used to it. OK. But the tragedy for those with ASD is there are hundreds of students at high school and no one welcomes you, appreciates you, wants to include you, accepts you for who you are. And you go up to other teenagers and say, hi, and they look at you as though your dog excretes you. And that's what the sense of loneliness is about. There are so many people there, but nobody wants to know you, accept you, and value you. And that sense of loneliness can be very, very profound. It's also a time when those with Asperger's may reject the diagnosis, not because they reject the characteristics that are true, but they know at high school having a disability is a reason to be tormented, teased, ridiculed, etc. Because the one group in lifetime that is the least accommodating and accepting, it's teenagers who pride themselves on being risky and breaking the boundaries, but in fact have an incredibly narrow tolerance within their peer group. And that kid starts to feel that they are not welcomed. And it's a, an intense sense of loneliness. Now, for some with Asperger's, they may then decide, OK, that's going to be my career. And what we do find, a career in the sense of social, that uh, there's a higher proportion than we'd expect of those with ASD who are asexual, celibate. Decide, I don't get relationships. I've never got them. I don't understand the dating game. It's fraught with difficulties and failures and vulnerability and misinterpretation. And you end up like Temple Grandin, who is a multimillionaire because of designing cattle feedlots, is an exceptionally content person because of the success she has and definition of herself by designing cattle feedlots, but she's never wanted and so is not disappointed by relationship aspects. Her sense of self is founded on what she does. However, there are those who do find a partner. Yes, they do. And one of the things I say to the teenagers is, is for the teenage boys, I say, wait, wait. I know you want a girlfriend, right? Great, yeah, lovely. But girls your age are into risky, highly popular, good-looking guys. And your honesty, integrity, loyalty, compassion aren't valued by teenage girls. No. But eventually, they'll realise that doesn't make a good partner. In fact, it's rather hurtful. So wait 
until girls are in their mid-twenties and become maternal, and then they'll fall in love with you because you're still a virgin and... <laughs> a whiteboard they can write on for the first time. So, uh, I say, be patient, they'll grow up and appreciate you. Now, when I look for aspects of who's a partner, because how many of you are parents of kids with ASD? Yes, mums one day want to resign. They want to pass him on to someone else. And if I wanted to become a multi-billionaire, I would do a dating agency for Aspies. And their mums would pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to have arranged marriages. I thought that was a terrible thing. Now I think it's a really good idea. Nice arranged marriage. Because, you know, she wants to... Right, OK, I am a father of a child, a young man with Asperger's. William is 33 now. Still lives at home. Um, and my wife and I have thought of... Anyway, right. Um, <laughs> we'll pay her a fortune now, because uh, we'd like to go on holiday together now. So some do find a partner. Now you've got... I, hope, I can't see that. I think you've got a bell-shaped curve. The bell-shaped curve is actually for IQ, intelligence quotient. With the midpoint being 100, the vast majority of people have an IQ between 70 and 130. That's the normal range. Now, when you go from 100 to 145 plus, well, if we take 145 plus, um, are there any psychologists here? Could you raise your hand if you're a psychologist? One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven... OK. Well, first of all, we psychologists know that our IQ is 145 plus. <laughs> because IQ tests measure what psychologists are good at, and we've done the Stanford Binet and Vexler, so we know the answers in the back of the book. So if you give us an IQ test, we're going to be 145... We better be, because we know the answers. Um, but don't call it IQ... But SQ, not intelligence quotient, social quotient. The average social quotient is 100. The range is 70 to 130. Now, as you move from 100 to 145 plus, the gender ratio changes. And we find that there are fewer men and proportionately more women in the upper end of the social reasoning empathy continuum. However... Up at 145, there are some men who are rare. <laughs> we are. Uh, they are. Uh, but mainly women at that point. Now, when you go below 100, those characteristics are, tends to be more males than females. Now, 0 to 55 is classic autism. 55 to 70 is Asperger's syndrome. And what we do clinically is make an artificial line of what is clinically significant. But Aspies have always been here as part of the nature of human nature, and we make an artificial line. Now, when we look for a partner, there's one of two groups. So if the Aspie is 60 to 75, and who's their partner in social quotient, not IQ, social quotient, then we find it's someone from the same area. Now, these are a couple who, you know, university met studying entomology together. I made that up. And when I did a presentation in the United States in a break, a couple of parents came up to me and said, Tony, how did you know that my husband and I studied entomology at university? <laughs> and for this couple, a romantic, sensuous evening is sitting in separate chairs reading aloud to each other from their entomology textbooks. And if it's coming up to Christmas... And the neighbours go, ding-dong, on the bell for a bit of social chit-chat. They both hide behind the cabs. No one home, etc. And if it's the university Christmas dinner party, they look at each other and say, how long can you cope? Hour and a half? No, hour. OK, we'll both go after an hour. Their social capacity, little cup. And it's Saturday night and it's 8 o'clock. And they look at each other and say, mm, 8 o'clock, we've got to do it. The relationship counsellor says we've got to do it once a week. We have to have a hug. <laughs> what number hug would you like? A number six hug? Okay, number six hug? Right, okay. Now, can I go to my shed? No, no. Can I do my knitting? No, no. We've got to stay on a bit longer. It's not long enough. Okay. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Okay, go on. Good, right. Okay. So, in other words, they 
come from the same culture, the same expectations. But the other group are in the 130 plus in social empathy quotient. And what career do those people have? The caring professions. And you may not have realized it, that an occupational hazard of the caring professions is falling in love with an Aspie. Because you see the mind, the heart, not the behavior. So those are the things that can occur. But then you've got two very different mindsets in terms of social needs, etc. So the other group, so sometimes I say to the Aspies, if you want to find a partner, do some volunteer work. Do some volunteer work, either in the RSPCA, um, disabled kids, or geriatric homes, and that's where you'll find your partner because she'll understand you. Uh, or it's, well, one of the things we've, we've discovered is that when we see the kids with ASD, there's a greater than chance likelihood that dad is an engineer. But an even greater likelihood of ASD if dad is in information technology. An even higher risk of ASD if dad is an accountant. <laughs> but the ultimate career for risk of ASD is medicine. Yes. Because it's factual, encyclopedic information. And science, etc. And high status. So... Bear that in mind if you're a parent and you want to have a dating agency. Right, okay. Now, one of the things we look for in social understanding is what's called theory of mind. Mm. But I just need to find out something extremely important. Do we have a morning tea break? <laughs> Do we? I hope so, because I'm drinking all this water and I need to go to the toilet soon. <laughs> uh, so, do we have a break? Can anybody answer that? If not, I'll impose one. <laughs> no, nobody... Okay. Well, I, I think if we started at 9.30, and what time do we finish the morning session? 12.30. 12.30. We'll have a break at 11. Yeah? A comfort stop, because you'll probably need to go as well. <laughs> right. And especially at least 15 minutes, because the majority of people here are female... And you'll... Right, OK. We'll have an hour uh, morning tea. No. In social understanding, we have what's called theory of mind. That's the ability to work out what someone is thinking and feeling. Not to read a book, but to read a face and body language. So it's the ability to read and interpret the cues and context that indicate someone's feelings, thoughts, intentions and beliefs. So many of the kids at school feel an alien in the playground trying to relate to a new species, humans. They can relate to animals and dogs and cats and so on perfectly. Horses, yeah. But people, oh dear, that's another matter. But it's also the ability to self-reflect, to perceive and think about your own thoughts and to monitor, communicate and manage one's own emotions. So when you say to the kid with Asperger's, what are you feeling now? I don't know. When you hit him... What were you feeling then? I don't know. Okay. How was school today? Good, to shut you up, etc. Because um, he's like a war zone, he wants out there and doesn't want to talk about it, because if he's got to do that, he's got to relive the emotions. But how are you feeling now? I don't know. I'm going to complete the sentence. I don't know how to grasp the many thoughts and feelings in my mind, hold one, Identify it and label it and explain it in speech so that you will understand me. And so there's a great difficulty with self-disclosure. Now, a parent wants to know that because how is school today is not what did you learn, it's how did you cope emotionally, do I need to fix you, do you feel sad about something, are you upset about something? You want to know how the person feels, not what their result was for a mass test necessarily. But it's the ability to express your inner self. But that can also be a difficulty in friendship for teenagers where you are expected to disclose 
inner secrets and thoughts to a friend, but especially later on to a partner. And as one partner said, in my husband's autobiography, there will be chapters I will never read. Interesting. So there's a difficulty with self-disclosure. Now, one of the things we will look at is eye contact. And what we'll look at is, what's eye contact for? Well, first of all, um, this week I was talking to a 14, 13, 14 year old girl about how to make friends. She's very keen to make friends. She's very shy. She's a lovely girl. Her personality is, I make, she'd make a fantastic, she is not bitchy. Never will be. No, she doesn't play that game. But she's on the exterior and she would like to join in, but she doesn't know about the art of conversation. I was having to explain to her what to talk about, all those sorts of things. But one of the topics came up of eye contact. Now, eye contact is, yes, to read someone's thoughts and feelings, but it's also social punctuation. That is, you punctuate, you start a sentence with a capital letter, you look eye contact to indicate go to start the interaction. During that, if it's something important, you underline or italics, you look. If it is something emotional, exclamation mark, you look. If you need help and assistance, a question mark, you look. You have a comma, which means every so often you look to that person to see, are we on the same track, are you okay? And you end the utterance, full stop, by looking. So some of these guys may not need know and need to know when to look as a sense of punctuation. But another way we look is to read a face. And many of these kids look at your mouth to process you linguistically, not your eyes to work out what you are feeling. Sometimes they look away because they're trying to concentrate on how to reply to your comment or your question. And to look at you adds confusion, not clarity. And they can give a quicker response by turning away. Because if I said to you, OK, I want you to add 8, 19, 27 and 42. You go, um, hang on a moment. Um, 8, I'm right. OK, you look away to focus on what's important in your mental processing. They find it really disconcerting when people look at them. It's really unpleasant. But there are tests that we will look at on this. And I'm going to show you one now. We do this for adults, and I'm going to show you, and I don't think it's in your handouts, uh, eyes, okay? Just eyes. And there are four words. One word is an accurate description of what the person was thinking or feeling when this photograph was taken. But it's just the meaning in the eyes. Now, what I'm going to do is show you three of a test of 40. When you look at these eyes... Could you identify which of the four words describe the thoughts or feelings, and can you shout it out? Now, don't forget, if you shout out the wrong answer, I might think you've got Asperger's syndrome. <laughs> OK, are, are you ready? Here we go. Is this person joking, flustered, desire, or convinced? Desire. desire. Good. OK. Irritated, sarcastic, worried, or friendly? Worried. OK. Embarrassed, fantasizing, confused, or panicked? Fantasizing, yeah, absolutely right. How do you do that? <laughs> Seriously, how did you do that? Because that's what the Aspies say. How did you? So, in other words, if I do that, I'm fantasizing. If I do that, I'm worried. And if I do that, exactly. <laughs> wow. You're pre wired to know intuitively <coughs> the meaning in the eyes. The person with Asperger's can't automatically get that. One of the things we've started to find in some of the new research is if it's a neutral face, they will often think the person is anxious or angry. And if the person is mildly anxious or angry, they think they are very anxious or angry. So there can be a misinterpretation of those faces. It's also the ability to work out what's going on in a scene. And in the diagnostic assessment... I'll give the children this picture, and I'll say, what's happening? And the kid with Asperger's will say, uh, she's got her hand on the jar, and her brother has his hand on her shoulder. Oh, and, and there's lots of plants coming craw crawling down the wall. Oh, and there's some magazines. I wonder if there's any train magazines. Whereas typical kids will say, ah, she wants to steal a biscuit, but she doesn't want to get caught. 
She's got a friend to stand guard, so she's going to get a biscuit. He's got his hand on her shoulder. If an adult looks, he'll squeeze her shoulder, she'll drop the biscuit, and they're okay. But if she's got a biscuit, he wants half of it because he stood guard. <laughs> so you can read the intention in the faces, where they're looking, the hands, where the hands are. You can draw it all together to make an understanding. Kid with Asperger's with this one. Uh, he's giving her the ball. Okay. The little girl, how's she feeling? Happy. Why is she happy? Because he's giving her the ball. He's happy because he's sharing. He's being friendly. He's sharing the ball. Whereas typical kids will say, they've just <laughs> broken the window and they are, I won't say the expletive, but extremely worried as to how their parents will react and the consequences, or she can't understand why her brother is giving her the ball, <laughs> but as soon as, no, she broke it, not me. I'm not playing with it. She broke it. But a kid with Asperger's looked at that for about 10 seconds, silently, and then said, no, no way, impossible. No way would a ball that size make a hole that small in a window. <laughs> No, it wouldn't. It would have completely obliterated all the grass. It's not wrong, it's different. This is why they make good detectives, as in Saga and the Bridge, but that's another story. This scene, uh, kid with Asperger's, what's happening? Uh, they're having a conversation, right? What are they having a conversation about? Uh, what music to play on the hi-fi, okay? Whereas typical kids will say, uh-oh, the little boy's in trouble, how do you know by the look in dad's eyes and his eyebrows? Yeah? So it's not just the eyes, it's the eyebrows will give you so much information. This one, uh, Carol Gray showed it to a little boy and asked, she asked, how is the little girl feeling? And he said, oh, she's tired. Really? Why is she tired? She's holding up the bench. <laughs> okay. Now, what another activity I may do is I want to see the parents alone, ask the kids to go into the waiting area and to do something, and I'll ask them, could you draw me a picture of your classroom or playground? Haven't been to your school, don't know the classroom or playground, your choice which one. Can you draw me a picture? When you've finished, could you bring me the picture? I'd like to see it. Okay. Nine-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome, that's his classroom. Look at the positions of the desk. It's almost like an engineering plan. Uh, this is an eight-year-old girl with Asperger's syndrome. I like her trees, the way she's drawn them. This is a six-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome. Uh, and that's the clock and the door, etc. That's his classroom. This is a six-year-old girl with Asperger's syndrome. That's her playground. Ten-year-old girl with Asperger's, the slide and the sandpit. Eight-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome, playground. What's unusual about these drawings? Where are the people? Yeah. Okay. I assume somebody else goes to their school. Um, this is a... Um, whoops. Oh, hang on. This is the six-year-old sister of an eight-year-old boy with Asperger's, six-year-old neurotypical. But there are one, two, three, four people in that picture. You see the ladder on the right-hand side of the picture? There are two people climbing the ladder. It's a circle. It is just four lines for the limbs, two dots for the eyes, and sometimes a slash for the mouth. But she's six, and she's already using people in her picture. Now, this is a seven-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome. That's his classroom. Now, I suspect that if I looked into the window of his classroom from that perspective. That's exactly what I would see in the class. Now, if I've got the right photo, go picture next, he's got a five-year-old sister and she drew her classroom. That's it. You can tell it's the classroom by the light bulb. <laughs> and in the classroom, there's the teacher, Maddie, Maddie's friend, and a brown deposit that will be cleaned up later. <laughs> so for that little five-year-old, people are the most important part of life. It's an essential. That's what you see everywhere. Your mind is designed to 
see, prioritise and process social information. Now, this was a girl with Asperger's syndrome. That's her playground. Look at all the people. So I said, who's that? She's called Ashley, by the way, who drew this. Ashley. And who's that? Ashley, 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 and Ashley. <laughs> Ashley in the playground. Great. Now, what the girls may do in friendships is observe and try to understand before they make the first step. They don't want to make a social mistake. They don't want to be laughed at. Very cruel response. But one of the things the girls may do more than the boys is read fiction. Because in fiction, you can work out what people are thinking and feeling, theory of mind, not by reading a face, but reading the text. Because in the text is what Hermione is thinking and feeling at Hogwarts. And Hermione is the quintessential Aspie girl, no female friends. She's a tomboy and just relates to the two, Harry and Ron. Or, as a teenager, you watch soap operas, Home and Away. Because if you're not part of a group, you're not welcome, you're not included, but you want to learn it. And if you watch, and they say, who are you looking at? And criticise you and make you go away. But if you watch Home and Away and Neighbours, you can pick up what's going on. You can replay it, you can freeze it, you can understand it. So they may learn about people's thoughts and feelings and interactions by soap operas. They may decode social situations in doll play. So she's got 80 Barbie dolls all lined up in alphabetical order, or hairstyle, and she doesn't play Barbie getting married to Ken. No. Nah. She plays one Barbie's teacher, me, the rest of the class. And what she may do is use the Barbies to replay, to decode and unpack the social event. In other words, if you want to analyse it, and it's overwhelming at the time, take a mental video, replay it at home with the Barbies, slow it down, try and understand it, or use the Barbies to rehearse what to do or say tomorrow. So she may play with Barbies when she's 13, 14, 15 years old, not because she's developmentally immature, but it's a wonderful way of understanding relationships. Now, one of the things that if a boy makes a social mistake, he's likely to explode and then get diagnosed. Whereas what a girl may do if she makes a social error is go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings. And because she apologises so profusely, we forgive and forget. But the pattern is, she didn't know. The boys don't seem to get the art of apology very easily at all. Or they don't say, sorry, sorry, and you just say the magic word, sorry, and, you know, you're forgiven. No, it doesn't work like that. Or she appeases. And mum says, you're going to a birthday party at the weekend with your cousins. Will you be OK? Yes. Now, you haven't seen your cousins for about three or four years. They'll be strangers to you. Will you be OK? Yes. Now, I've got to take your brother to soccer. I'll be gone for a couple of hours. You'll be on your own. You'll be OK? Yes. But look at the terror in her eyes. The girls are often braver than the boys, or the girls learn to be obtuse, difficult, non-compliant, oppositional, defiant, pathological demand avoidance, in other words, passive-aggressive, to avoid those situations that could go wrong or they're uh, going to be unsure. Or she becomes a chameleon and she adapts a different persona or person according to the situation. So with grandma, she's like this. With the classroom, she's like that. With other people, she's like this. But she's got a mask, and everywhere she goes, she puts the mask on, and it's exhausting. When she's a teenager, she feels, I put so much effort into this mask, but I can't take it away because they may not like the person who's underneath. It's great. When I got the mask on, I'm cured. I'm fantastic. I get on. And many with Asperger's can socialise well for a couple of hours, but then, like Cinderella at the ball, at midnight, the wheels fall off. They just can't do any more. But for that time, great, fantastic. Then tomorrow, social migraine, under the covers, in the cupboard, don't want to see anybody, I've had enough. But for that time, I did it. But the mental energy is phenomenal. It's the mask. Emily masked in public and will melt down the second she's out of the situation. It becomes a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's imitation. It's observation, absorbing the speech, mannerisms and character, even persona, of someone who's socially successful. It's becoming an expert mimic and sometimes actually using speech and drama lessons to know how to act in everyday settings. And because she acts so well, 
the teacher doesn't believe she has Asperger's syndrome. And that can be the challenge. In the social adaptations of girls, they're often less disruptive and so less likely to be noticed. Quote, we think that if we are very, very good, people will like us and all will be well. And learn if you're good, you are left alone. Friends are animals. It's your dog, your cat, your horse. And time in nature to relax. So that's what the girl may do. But it's also the emotional sensitivity of ASD. That is both for the boys and girls. On the one hand, I say, yes, they're not very good at reading facial expressions, body language, working out what people are thinking and feeling. However, they can have a sixth sense to pick up negativity in other people. So if the teacher or parent is in a bad mood, if they are disappointed, anxious or agitated, the Aspie soaks it up like a sponge. Negative emotions in others are contagious to Aspies. And they describe, I take it on board, that person's depressed, now I feel depressed. And I don't know if this is me or it's contagious from the other person. So hypersensitive to negative moods in others. Quote, there's a kind of instant subconscious reaction to the emotional states of other people that I have understood better in myself over the years. If someone approaches me for a conversation and they are full of worry, fear or anger, I find myself suddenly in the same state of emotion. And it, particularly when I'm talking to adolescent girls with Asperger's, the bitchiness and meanness and problems of her peer group she takes on board herself. So sometimes the social isolation is not strictly because of social confusion, it's isolation as a protection from the negative moods and actions of other people. Quote, I'm able to distinguish very subtle cues that others would not see or it might be a feeling I pick up from them. It's a sixth sense. And it's avoidance of some social situations because of being sensitive to negative vibes. The picture is of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, who wrote the song, with Mike Love, of Good Vibrations. Remember that came out in the northern summer of 1966? Oh, celestial music. I, I'd previously become totally engrossed in the Beach Boys from God Only Knows, and the Pet Sounds album, the celestial harmonies, absolutely delightful. And I've met him, and he's Aspie. And what he's done is what we now pick up as very important, is he can't describe the self, inner thoughts and feelings, in conversational speech. It comes out in music, or art, or poetry, or typing. So there's an ability to have an eloquence in describing inner thoughts and feelings by any other means then look at me and tell me. Go to Google Images, type in sad, choose five images that represent your sadness. Find me a movie track that in this movie section, this movie clip, that describes your feelings in this situation. So if you're in a parent with a teenager and you want to find out what's going in their mind, it's not look at me and tell me, it's choose a music track from your CD collection or iTunes collection that in the lyrics or music perfectly describes your feelings. And I am amazed of the number of people in the rock industry with Asperger's. My daughter, youngest daughter Caroline, used to work in Sydney for Universal Music as a journalist. And she said, Dad, Dad, I've met all these famous rocks. Half of them are Aspie. And because she speaks Aspergerese, she gets on really well with them. And, and Universal said, Caroline, could you, could you talk to him? Because he won't sign the contract. And she said, and then, yeah, and, oh, he signed the contract. OK, right. Um, but there's also sensory sensitivity in social situations. It's children shouting in the playground. One thing that those with ASD hate is shouting. But the kids are shouting to each other. If you are in a house next to a primary school playground, at break or recess time, the noise level is horrendous. Houses next to schools should have double glazing for people like they have for airports. 
It's running and chasing in the playground and actually being bumped or touched by other kids, so tactile defensiveness. It's balloons that could burst at a birthday party. So don't go to a birthday party, not necessarily because of the social. Balloons could go pop. The aroma of someone. I hate Mrs. Smith, but Mrs. Smith's a wonderful teacher. I hate her. She thinks the world of you. I hate her. She makes me want to vomit. What do you mean she makes you want to vomit? She smells of coffee. So sometimes there's an aversion to people because of the sensory pattern or bright or patterned clothing or bright lights. So those are the factors you've got in a social setting. In social understanding, it's the maturity and friendship skills and the choice of companions. Often the kid is two years younger than their chronological age in social understanding, so he's nine and he plays well with six or seven-year-olds or talks to the 12, 13-year-olds about chess, example. There's a limited vocabulary for characterization. So when I say to the kids, your teacher, Mrs. Smith, I don't know her. What's she like? Uh, she likes chocolate. Yes, that's what she likes. What sort of a person is she? A girl. What else can she? She's tall. Yeah, right, okay. Whereas typical kids have a quick vocabulary to describe people. These kids often don't have that vocabulary to describe people. We use programs like the Mr. Men books, like um, Mr. Happy, uh, Mr. Cheerful. And we say, who do you know who's like uh, Mr. Nosy? Yes, the school principal, but don't call him Mr. Nosy. Or Mr. Worry. So for the young kids, we'll use the Mr. Men books to start teaching them characterization. There's often a lack of vocabulary to describe emotions and a lack of vocabulary to describe personality. And for teenagers and adults, one of the hardest questions to answer is, who are you? Not only the self-reflection, but the vocabulary to describe the self. Now, there's a limited response to peer pressure. So they often are viewed as not cool, poor in the currency of friendship. In other words, they're perceived as an alien species, which is a green light for bullying and teasing because they're not human is the attitude of their peer group. They are often unaware of the codes of social conduct. As I've said earlier, they're like Italian drivers. They keep making mistakes. They're not reading the signals. They socialize less frequently than other kids. Often, it's, I call it being alone, not necessarily lonely. Each of us has a capacity for socializing. These kids, it's a cup. Most kids, it's a bucket. And when that cup is full in the classroom, that's it. It drains slowly in solitude. Whereas for typical kids, their capacity is a bucket, but when they socialise, it energises. It enthralls. It's what you go to school for. But for kids with Asperger's, it's draining, fraught with error. It's confusing. It's overwhelming. It's harder work socialising than any school subject. So when they go into the playground... It's a time of intense intellectual effort. Shorter duration of friendships. They may make a friend, but they may not last as long because there may be problems in that. They feel betrayed by their friendship, and they may unintentionally or sometimes deliberately alienate their peer group by being too intense, too intrusive. It's not their intention, but they're breaking the rules. But also a very common characteristic is not seeing friends out of school. They may have one or two at school that they hang around with, but they don't get invited for sleepovers or to meet after school. Sometimes the kids with Asperger's don't want that. And as far as they're concerned is, when I close the doors of school, that's it. Home is my castle. Right, top of the tower, Minecraft, that's it. I've had enough socialising. I don't have to. And so as far as they're concerned... They want solitude as their emotional and energy recovery at home on their own. They're often not called by friends, uh, so they're not popular in um, social media, other than social media for bullying and teasing. Not invited to social gatherings, but they're more likely to have a friend with ASD because they meet each other and they've got the same interests. And so sometimes when we're working at the Minds and Hearts Clinic, and we do group activities to manage emotions or learn particular skills, they make very good friendships with each other. And they understand each other. And one of the great benefits of group work with those with ASD is not only teaching how to manage your sadness or your anxiety, is making friends with like-minded people. 
Now, another way that they may have friends is a friend from a different culture who is more accepting of being different. So you've got a refugee comes to the school, is on the periphery, hasn't got any friends, different culture, can't quite get it. And so the Aspie and he or she combine similar issues and they become friends. But over time, that visiting new kid makes friends and then chooses to be with those that the kid with Asperger's feels, what, did that, what, what happened? We were good friends at the beginning of term. Now I hardly ever see them. Those sorts of things. But also, um, remember I said, who falls in love with an Aspie? Is one of two groups. Either both accountants, engineers. And I've now discovered that en I was doing a course recently for the engineering department of the University of Queensland to help them cope with um, Aspie students. And what I didn't know, because I was at university in the 70s, uh, today, half the students in engineering are female. Amazing. I always thought of engineering... Anyway, right, they're both engineers. And um, if you've got through the family tree, who married who, like, who do you think you are? You know they do the family tree. You will get Asperger's, yes, often, between generations and within generations. But remember I said extreme neurotypicals. Highly socially skilled, gregarious, really understand socialising, fall in love with an Aspie. Right. In the same family tree. So the chances are the Aspie kid may well have a brother or sister who is socially popular, lots of friends, gregarious, everything the Aspie isn't. And incredible jealousy because they've got a sibling who's at the opposite end of the continuum. And that can cause great conflict. So there's a jealousy and envy for those who easily interact and enjoy socialising. So other things we look at are a list of children as friends who do not consider them within their social group. So I ask the kid who your friends are. They'll give me three or four names. But if you ask those kids, is he your friend? No, not really. We, we, sometimes we sit together, sometimes I help him, but we're not friends. But the kid thinks that they may be. And there's a difference between teaching them the social skills and actually applying that in real life situations. More on that later. Because when they're calm and it's not overwhelming, they will be able to do the greetings and the conversation. It sounds great. <laughs> But in real life, and there's lots of kids, two's company, three's a crowd, that's it. They can't do it. So one of the problems is you can teach the friendship skills, but there's enormous difficulty in transferring it to real life settings. You've got to work on that. So boys, gradually social games become more sophisticated with greater sportsmanship required. And for many of these guys, they're clumsy, poorly coordinated. So for the boys, because you're clumsy, you're not included in those activities. Girls... Gradually, more personal disclosures, conversation than play, more complex friendship rules and bitchiness, and the girls get further and further behind on that. So they become less connected with increasing grade level. The gap widens. So in grade one, the gap's not that great, but by grades eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, there's a very significant gap occurring. In the social profile, it's not wanting or needing the degree of social involvement advocated by parents and teachers who forever want him to be more socialising. And he says, I've had enough. And sometimes I say to parents, he has. He's got enough socialising at school. He needs to be alone at home. But it's also the amount of effort that goes into socialising. Quote, I describe my social life with this analogy, woman with Asperger's. Swimming in the water is nice at first. But if it goes on for too long or too often, I start to drown. So sometimes I can cope with occasional short duration socialising, but I've had enough. One of the things I did with a girl recently who sometimes she wants to socialise, sometimes she doesn't, and she feels allegiance to the friends and they want me to socialise, but I haven't got the energy, I don't want to do it, but I don't want to disappoint them, but I can't, what do I do? And I said, right, OK, it's a common characteristic to wear these bands. You have three. Green orange and red. When you're wearing the green band, it means I'm up for socialising, I'm in there, I'm OK, green light. When I'm wearing the orange one, yep, 
chat for a moment or two, then that's it. I'd love to chat, but very briefly, I know I've had enough. Red, it's bye, see you later. So either she learns the phrases to politely indicate, no, I haven't got the energy to socialize at the moment, or she's got a little visual device to say how much she wants to do. And it's that recovery from social exhaustion. It drains me mentally and physically. I am exhausted after having spent a lot of time with others and I need to recover in solitude. It's like Cinderella at the ball at midnight. I can socialize, then I can't do any more. Caroline, not my daughter Caroline, but a different Caroline, I relished isolation and solitude. And when I was by myself, I thoroughly enjoyed the company of an empty room. So those with ASD throughout their day need islands of tranquility and solitude to cope. But how at school can you ever be safely alone? In the isolation, you're becoming saturated with socialising in the classroom because you have to intellectually process events without interruption. And often, because they take some time, especially for the teenage boys. And what happens, from, really, actually, from grade five onwards, four or five onwards for boys... When they're together, it's not just the physical sportsmanship. It's repartee and jokes and the speed. Now, for those with Asperger's, they go... And they come up with a brilliant, funny, perfect answer. Five seconds too late. And all they go, duh, stupid, where were you? But he took him that long length of time to work it out. It was brilliant. And if he said it half a second after the other guy said it... They'd all laugh and they'll all be together. But because he's out of sync, because of processing time, intellectually it causes major problems because they intellectually process. And um, they need an emotional and energy restore restorative, often escaping into imagination and solitude is what they need. But by isolation and imagination, they are offline from the socialising that's occurring. They may play with imaginary friends and animals, quote, I invented games you can play without other children. And the peers cause more challenges than solutions. And sometimes it's being alone, not necessarily lonely, unless it's high school. Now, this is good timing. Because the next section I want to do is going to be on the four stages of friendship for typical kids. But I did promise, and people are already getting up to go because it's... The toilets are over there. OK, on your marks, get set, go! And I, I think we welcome back all the people who are on the internet, and I think we're OK. Shh. What I've been going through has been a description of the social challenges faced by those with an autism spectrum disorder. And I think such individuals are incredibly brave in trying to engage with neurotypicals because neurotypicals can be incredibly confusing and intolerant of someone, especially at school, who does not have the level of social understanding of the peer group. Now, for typical kids, there are four stages in the development of friendship. So any kid with ASD, this is the stage of friendship that their peers may be going through and the sorts of things we've got to work on. Now, level one in friendship is about three to six years old. Now, the photograph is actually, on the left-hand side, is our daughter, Caroline, when she was three. And she's with her friend, Katie. Now, that, that photograph reminds me is friendship is a very personal decision. Parents can't say, you two will become friends, or a teacher can't say, you two can't, will become friends. Um, it's also when you're a parent and your children's choice of partner may... Anyway, right. Um, <laughs> However, um, what reminds me here is she and Katie just got on, and although they've been separated for years because of different continents, whenever they meet, they're very good friends. So it's a very personal and difficult to define what makes a friend, but it can occur naturally. So for three to six years old, what are typical kids seeing as a mark of friendship? It's a recognition of sharing, not just possession and ownership, it's sharing your things and taking turns. Now, if you ask a kid at this age, who are your friends? It's a friend has toys the kid wants to play with. He's my friend because he's got a trampoline. He's my friend because he's got Minecraft or whatever. 
or it's a friend because he helps me. It's a very self-centered view of friendship, really, or proximity in the sense of, why is so-and-so your friend? He or she sits near me, unmomentary friends. Now, the kid with Asperger's may be 8, 9, 10, but his view of a friend is anyone who sits next to me says hello. In other words, they are acquaintances rather than the depth of friendship you'd expect for a person that age. Now, what we do, we ask an adult to act as a friend because often at this stage, remember three to six, kid with ASD, not interested in their peer group, boring and stupid, but they are interested in adults. And so it may be that an adult needs to become momentarily a friend to rehearse and play together with the adult being able to freeze it, slow it down, explain it, and respond appropriately in a way another four, five, six-year-old couldn't do. Now, the adult needs to learn child speak, always. We had a group for nine to 12-year-old kids. And uh, what we were doing was we got a group of as all Aspie kids, except for one, uh, playing Lego, and we were teaching how do you join in. And one of the kids with Asperger's came up to the group and said, excuse me, can I join in, please? And we thought, great. But the typical kid in the group said, nah, you don't say that. That's what adults say. You say, sup. And we went, sorry? Yeah, sup. What's up? And we thought, oh. And I was like, can I join in, please? Which is a very sort of British type of, of greeting. But that's not what kids do. And it's not what the current generation do. So it's important that you watch and analyze the greetings and interactions of the peer group to teach the conventions. It's learning child speak, it's playing games together, you take turns in what to do next, or to do a jigsaw puzzle, you do alternate pieces and so on. But I ask the adult to fake you can't do it, and ask the child for help. Because asking and giving help is one of the major indicators of friendship. So it needs to be in the interaction with the adult. Helping is a common characteristic. We also go through the games of what else could it be? It's just that typical kids at this age, three to six years old, do a lot of let's pretend. And they're comfortable with let's pretend. And it's a good way of being flexible in thinking for problem solving later on. But for this kid, it's a block of wood. It can't be a mobile phone. It's a block of wood. What do you mean it's a mobile phone? It's a block of wood. So there's a very literal interpretation. So part of improving problem solving for flexibility, but being comfortable with other kids where they suddenly change the rules or let's pretend, what else could it be, is a very good social game to play. But also, many of the kids enjoy watching a screen. And in fact, that is their best way of learning. Now, an illustration of this is a phenomenon that the United States has fewer children with ASD than it should because it exports them to Australia. <laughs> because many of our Aspies speak with an American accent because they learn language not from their parents, not from their peers, but television. Dora the Explorer, for example. And so their best way of learning is a screen. The problem is not what they're doing, because unlike teachers, screens do not get premenstrual tension or hangovers. <laughs> or say, wait till I finished. Except, well, I suppose in a way they do. But what it means is the problem is what they're watching, the content, not the screen. But they need videos, social documentaries, of their everyday experiences with their peers, playmates, friends at school, or potential friends, doing the activities that they can be expected to join in. So you can then use the pause button when the cue is given to join in, the smile, the look, etc. So you play the game of freeze the video when you see the cue to join in, or how to leave, because sometimes the kids with ASD just walk off, and the other kids go, is he coming back? <laughs> are, are we finished? Because as far as he's concerned, off we go. So it's in the whole sequence of the interaction. So they need video recordings, and you may, as a parent or as a therapist, 
video a particular game, chase, hide and seek or whatever, they watch it on the video, then immediately play that game at home. It's a rehearsal for real life setting. So it's watching other children as a model of what to do. But be careful who they watch and model, because sometimes it's not the ones we want them to imitate. Um, th th this is where uh, we had a clinical student who was going through our filing cabinet for sorting out, uh, putting the files back. And she said, Tony, do you realize that the most challenging children you've ever seen seem to have a first name starting with the letter J? So Jordans, Jareds, and Jadens are an absolute disaster. Bens are usually okay. So remember, whatever name you give your child will determine their later psychopathology. <laughs> um, so watch, not Jared, watch Ben as the one to watch. Um, also rent a friend. That is, choose someone who seems to understand him so you act, first of all, with an adult, then rent a friend. It's a kid who seems to understand, can slow it down, explain, is supportive as a dress rehearsal before the rest of the uh, children or class. But it's very important to have an inclusion with typical children so that they can modify their social play to accommodate the child. But typical children are natural child psychologists. And they know intuitively that this kid is different. He doesn't talk like us, doesn't think like us, doesn't play like us. He's different, or she's different. So what we have to do there is they need to know why. And for that, I tend to use Carol Gray's program, Sixth Sense. And the Sixth Sense program is a lesson plan for kindergarten to about grade four to explain the nature of ASD to the peer group. So you have the senses, the ability to hear, the ability to see. For example, and we say to the kids, if your friend wears glasses to read the whiteboard and he's forgotten his glasses and he can't read it, would you call him stupid? No. Would you call him, what would you do? I'd help him, I'd explain. Right, so sometimes people can't read not the whiteboard but facial expressions. It's that sort of component. We will also do games of, okay, you've got a group of chairs or a, almost like a course to go through to get from one to the other, like a maze. And you say, okay, one of you is going to go from here to here, but you're going to be blindfolded and all the other kids are going to give you directions of how to get there. And the first one is, okay, whatever he or she does, criticize them, laugh at them, say it's stupid. No, no, not that. Oh, God, I've done it stupid again. You don't know which way to go, do you? You're et cetera. Right. Do they get to the end or do they give up? And when they do, how do you feel? I feel stupid. I feel really bad. Okay, let's do it again. But this time give lots of encouragement of praise the closer they are to the destination. What does it feel like? That's what the person is doing. He's going through the maze, I would say, minefield of social interaction. So to be positive with a person rather than negative. And there's a very good book just written by Kathy Hoopman, which goes through the characteristics of Asperger's for teachers, but little class activities for that. Now, Lorraine, Lorraine, have you got Kathy Hoopman's new book on for teachers? Okay, well, I've just mentioned it, so people may want to buy it. Uh, but it's very good. Um, What's it called? Uh, <laughs> okay, Lorraine, what's it called? Sorry? <laughs> the Essential... Uh, I wrote the foreword to it. Um, oh, I read it, but I forgot what it's called. But it's very good, very good. And it's got, for each of the characteristics, uh, an activity you can do in the class so that the other kids can understand the child's difficulties. Now, there's also social stories developed by Carol Gray. Now, social stories explain the social conventions. And it's a bit like when you go to a foreign country, you have a guide to Thailand, a guide to Dubai, or, or whatever it is. Now, I learned the value of this when I was in Thailand, and I was 
giving a presentation. In the evening, I was at a very 10-star hotel um, talking with a group of Thai Chinese people. And as I was talking and relaxing, I, I happened to put my foot on my knee in an open gesture. And as soon as I did that gesture, they went, <gasps> absolutely horrified and disgusted. And, and they were staring at my shoe. And I thought, that's a bit rough. These are expensive shoes. These are churches. I mean, these are about $400 at least, a pair. I mean, I must have trodden in something. So I went like that to have a look. And they were even more offended. And then they said, Tony, in our culture, if you show someone your shoe or the sole of your shoe, it's the equivalent in Australia of doing this to someone. Okay? <laughs> That's just a position of a finger which we associated with something obscene. So I didn't realise I was breaking the rules by that. So if you're in Thailand and it's a big crowded street and you want to get across and you can't, take a shoe off. Got a shoe, got a shoe, got a shoe. <laughs> like the Red Sea, they'll no, 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 and, and you're through. They'll hate you, but you're through. Now, I'd ordered just the one gin and tonic, and a Thai waitress in Thai national dress appeared with a tray and my gin and tonic. And I was going, oh, it's infectious, ASD. Forget the neurological explanations, it's infectious. The more you live with or work with people with ASD, the more ASD you become. <laughs> if you can't beat them, join them. So, I was going, oh, gin and tonic. But as she approached me, she went down on her knees and shuffled towards me. And I thought, oh no, has she had a drop attack? Has she, has she had a seizure? You know, I, uh, do, do I go down on my knees and shuffle towards her? I sort of <laughs> bop her on the head, I have no idea. <laughs> and they said, she, great respect, she won't turn her back on you, and, and, and so on. And I needed that information. In Japan, I'm treated with great reverence. And somebody would, would bow. I thought, I then bow the same amount. No. They have to do it again, more. <laughs> and I thought, OK, I didn't do it enough. I'll do it again. <laughs> and, then, and then they go, mm, like this, and, and we're getting quite absurd. But that's what it's like for kids with Asperger's. But nobody's teaching them the rules. How can someone who knows every dinosaur in the Jurassic period not know social rules? And so this is what a social story is. It explains the logic. What works with ASD is logic, not punishment. You can say, right, off to the thinking chair. He can think in there for two decades, and he still won't work it out. So you start with the social story on success. You were so good at that, let's write a social story about it. And you go through in that social story the logic, what you do, and so on. Half of social stories are to record success. So when he's done a successful play or interaction, let's write a social story about how good you were. Now let's write one of something that we need a bit of an explanation for. Now, um, we also do for teenagers social articles. I'll do one of those later on. But this is an example of a social story on helping. Uh, sometimes children help me. They do this to be friendly. Yesterday, this is an American child, I missed three math problems. Amy put her arm around me and said, it's OK, Juanita. She was trying to help me feel better. Now, think Aspie, three math problems wrong. Amy squeezes you. How does squeezing you teach you to solve math problems? <laughs> she did it because it would make Amy feel better. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily make Juanita feel better, OK? We may have to add in a few lines on that. She was trying to help me feel better. On my first day at school, Billy showed me my desk. That was helpful. Children have helped me in other ways. Here's my list of how helpful people have been. I will try to say thank you when children help me. Now, this is written down formally, but eventually you learn a style of speaking a social story that it is an issue of education, not correction. And they need to know what to do and why, and the logic. Now, in the social curriculum for stage one, logic and understanding is in a social story. It's observation and good practice. Sometimes I do ask when parents are working with a kid, I say, look, sometimes can you do it wrong? You are intrusive. You are rude. Please do that. And then freeze it and say to the child, hang on, I did something wrong there. What did I do that was wrong? You snatched it. You didn't say, right, okay, 
I'll do it again, but this time see if I do it right. So if anything, it's the adult who does what the kid is doing, and the kid works with you to correct it. Okay, so it's not personalised. So it's fun watching what not to do. You can have a bit of silliness. Uh, guidance and encouragement in the requirements of friendship, and also guidance and encouragement from peers. Because the peers need, do we let him get away with this? Sometimes the kids are too rejecting. Sometimes they're too accommodating. And they need to respond appropriately in that setting. But again, success is recorded in a social story. Now, these are the topics for three to six-year-olds. Entry skills, looking for the cues, the greeting, the welcome. It's assistance, it's helping that it is given, asked and sought for, because sometimes the kids don't ask for help themselves because they don't want to appear stupid. So we say asking for help is a friendly and smart thing to do. It's accepting suggestions, incorporating ideas, agreement. So when somebody says that, ah, oh, good idea, I'll give it a try. It's reciprocity, it's the balance in conversation, activities. It's not being dominant or subordinate. Some of the girls can be too subordinate. And it's almost like another girl is too much of a bossy boots for them, or the girl herself is too much of a bossy boots. It's sharing resources and attention to various activities. It's showing interest in what someone is doing. It's listening to what they're saying and looking at what they're doing. If you want to avoid interaction and seek solitude appropriately, you don't do it by thumping someone or saying something rude. And it's ending the interaction, the closure. So all these components in the sequence of interaction need to be explored. And if they do it right, applaud them, thank them, you did it right. Many with Asperger's say the only feedback I got was when I did it wrong. But nobody told me what I did right. So you say what they did right. If they are confused, don't know, miss the cue, this is a learning activity. They need to learn what to do. Now, level two is six to nine years old. That's our son, William, who has Asperger's syndrome. Uh, he's 33, still lives at home. That's why that matrimonial agency, um, you know. <laughs> right, OK, now, uh, approximately six to nine years old, it's the concept of reciprocity and being fair. And when we look at kids with ASD, one of the major triggers for agitated, disruptive behavior is the concept of not fair. And sometimes games are not fair, and kids do things like that. And that really upsets them. And then other kids know they can break the rules, make him get upset, and it's good entertainment. It's helping each other out. And that's what a friend will do. Don't help me, but we help each other. You like the same activities. And at this stage, because of friendship, you may do what your friend wants, but you don't want to. But fair's fair. Next time, he owes you to do what you want to do that he may be reluctant to. But in friends, you have that reciprocity. So why is so-and-so your friend? Well, she comes to my party, and I go to her. So for typical kids, there's that balance of invitations and inclusion. Now, friendships for girls with ASD at this age, six to nine, is often the girl with ASD doesn't play bitchy. She can be remarkably honest, well, honest to a fault sometimes, but remarkably loyal, trustworthy, and she's not into in-group, out-group. And because she's not bitchy, she may have one friend. In ASD, two's company, three's a crowd. They find it very difficult to be in a group of more than two because it's far too complicated, fast, and I can't understand it. But one-on-one, -on -one, I can just about cope. So she has one friend who knows that she isn't going to be bitchy and she will help with your maths homework because she's maths talented, all languages. But that friend becomes an unpaid teacher aide in the classroom and the playground to advise her and guide her. And people will say, well, she's got a friend. Yes, then that friend is excellent. But if that friend moved interstate, she'd have no idea what to do. So that friend, and it's a very valuable component, may provide the guidance. But many of the girls are tomboys. Quote, it was easier to identify with boys because they just wanted to have fun. 
girls had more social rules to follow or blunder. They had more gossip and didn't like to get dirty. The guys were fun, and I can almost be myself around them. I, I don't know how to do girl things. Now, being a tomboy at primary school, good on you. Yeah, great. But when you're at high school and you look androgynous, if not male, then you can be torn to shreds by the other girls. And it's interesting that I often find with the high school girls with Asperger's, they have quite a few boys who are friends. Not romantically, but they seem to get on with the boys better. They understand the boy jokes. And so sometimes their friends are boys rather than girls. But when she's younger, she may be a tomboy. Many stereotypical girl activities were stupid, boring, and inexplicable. It's more accurate to say that I'm gender neutral. As a child, I like to play with boys because I enjoy toy cars, Lego, building blocks, sports, and that kind of thing. And sadly, girls are not often given toys like cars and blocks. Also, girls were more complicated and unkind in ways I didn't understand. Boys are more logical. Yes, yeah, so you can see why she may drift towards the boys. But for the boys with Asperger's, liking to be on your own, if you're on your own, you're going to be spotted by one of two groups. Either the predators that will torment you and tease you, or as a boy, you're spotted by the girls. And the girls are kind and nice to you, and you're cute and handsome and confused, and it brings out their maternal instincts, and they adopt you, and they're delighted to have captured a boy. <laughs> and if you don't understand their games, that's all right. You're a boy. We will explain it to you. I'm going to play teacher or mum. Now, the problem for the boy is then, if he is with the girls, two things may occur. One, even further rejection from the boys, because you play with girls, you're gay. Or, he starts to imitate feminine gestures and movements, because that's the group that accepts him. And he starts to think, if I became a girl, would I be cured of Asperger's? And the girl can think, if I became a boy, would I be cured of Asperger's syndrome? So right from the beginning, there can be what we call gender dysphoria, unhappy with your gender, because of the not following the conventional sequence of friendships. So, level two activities, six to nine-year-olds, uh, not with an adult now, but role-playing activities with the peer group. In a small group, rehearsal, feedback, and rewards. It's a little bit of social engineering of who they sit next to, who they're with, for protection and so on. So the teacher may need to decide where at the table they sit. Now, don't forget, years ago, for Aspies at school, it was much easier. You sat at a desk, which was a certain distance from every other desk. There was a teacher right in front of you, blackboard, and you remembered facts, and you recall facts. Great. Today, you sit at a round table. You work as a group. The teacher relates and entertains and facial expression as he's on stage to entertain and enthrall the audience. But that's not the Aspie way of learning. There's all the dangly bits to distract you, which they didn't have in years gone by. So for modern kids with Asperger's, the social expectation of group work and cohesion in the classroom is very stressing for them. So there are resources, there are books on friendship, and if you go to my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au, um, there's a variety of books, and Lorraine will have some of those there today. One of them, for example, is not available, uh, Lorraine has informed me, is called How Humans Make Friends. It's the top left-hand corner one. <laughs> this is an alien who comes to planet Earth and does a study of kids' friendships, goes back to his home planet and does a PowerPoint presentation about how weird humans are in how they develop friendships. Okay? It's, it's amazing. Um, there are also books, What is Friendship and Friendly Facts. There's a variety of books. If you go to Amazon, you can then type in friendship, age group, and there are a lot of resources that you can use that will teach it, either as a home project, classroom project, etc. When I started in this area 20 years ago, there was nothing. Now, there are quite a few programs realizing the resources that are needed. So What is Friendship by Pamela Day and Friendly Facts by Josie Santamoro and Margaret and 
Carter. There's also to teach theory of mind skills. Remember I said that's the ability to read thoughts and feelings, etc. Now this one, teaching children with autism to mind read. This is an example. I'll read it out. You can see the picture. Uh, Jamie is in the car. The barrier comes down. The train is coming. How will Jamie feel when the train is coming? Here are some pictures to give you a clue. Well, my answer is it depends on if he's autistic or not. Because if he's got autism, he's going to be happy. Because, oh, no, there's a four, one, seven, nine. No, 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 no. It's dad who's going to be upset. Now, I chose this one deliberately because it has personal connotations. When we first moved to Australia, we were in Brisbane and um, in Launton, north of Brisbane, near the railway line, and I'd bought an old Volvo station wagon. When I bought it, I had no idea how notorious it was for breaking down and being very difficult to start. It was Monday morning, and I was taking the kids to school, all three in the back of the car, with the Volvo, on the crossing, at Launton, and on the crossing, it broke down. And the barrier came down, and the freight train from Brisbane to Rockhampton was bearing down on us. Now, obviously, I'm here, and it did start. But that morning, it was show and tell. Caroline was five years old, and she stood up and she said, hey, guys, guess what? <laughs> Today, my daddy said the F word. <laughs> Actually, I think Rosie, who's um, now a teacher of autistic kids, um, she, said, she, she said, yeah, I was nine, and that was the first time I'd ever heard you say the F word. I was rather pleased with that, actually. Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, there are books like How to Be a Friend uh, activity. So, in other words, it's in observation. Was that a friendly or not friendly thing to do in stories? Try and use every opportunity to get a concept of friendly. Now, it, this is more important now in communication skills. It's the art of attentive listening, and that includes looking at that person. It's the topics of conversation, and one of the things that the kids with ASD will tend to do, if in doubt, switch topics to dinosaurs. <laughs> and it always ends up with dinosaurs. So it's the art of repair. What do you mean by, can you give me an example? Topics of conversation and narrative ability. Otherwise, they just go on and on and on and monologue without realizing, not now, this is boring. They don't need to know that. So it's looking at communication skills. The speech pathologist can help in the area of pragmatics of language, the use of language in a social context. Now, remember I said faces are like traffic lights. You can use this further. You can have traffic lights and facial expressions. And with guidance, show them this face. Is this a red light face, an amber light face, or a red light face, a green face, etc.? And when you see that face, these are some of the things you can say. So it's understanding that. It's no tailgating, being too close to someone. Men at work, not interrupting somebody which I find ironic because they interrupt others all the time, but they hate being interrupted themselves. <laughs> and when I ask them about interruptions, first of all, they say, I can't read the not now signals. Secondly, if I wait, I'll forget what I was going to say. Thirdly, whatever I'm going to say is more important than whatever you're doing, <laughs> etc. So, and speed limit, talking too fast and so on. So we'll use the metaphor of road signs for social signs. Now, we need a teacher assistant, an anthropologist in the classroom. Are there any teacher aides here, teacher assistants? OK, a few. Right. Something we need to be aware of. There are three major problems with teacher aides, three very significant problems with them. OK, these are number one. Teacher aides are grossly underpaid undervalued and undertrained because they do PhD level teaching. It's not teaching what other kids were taught or they were taught themselves. This is teaching the social curriculum. It's how to read a face, not how to read a book. It's how to read the social signals. So a teacher aid in a classroom setting is crucial. So to identify the relevant social cues. So when the teacher goes, <clears throat> it doesn't mean she needs a throat lozenge. <laughs> it's guidance in what to do or say. It's providing encouragement and positive feedback, explanations of why you're expected to do particular things, guidance, and also feedback to the peer group, how to manage emotions and conflict resolution at this stage, and knowing when the child needs to be alone. So in fact, it's being 
a social guide, a psychologist, it's being a speech pathologist, etc. It's a very advanced level of skill to be a teacher aide for a kid with ASD because of the complexities of what's required. Um, caution here, adult supervising, especially in the playground setting, may be more concerned with safety than social engagement. You don't want that aid to be a barrier, but a means of facilitating inclusion. And children with age tend to be less likely to be engaged with peers, so the aid needs to know when to back off, watch from a distance, but let nature take its course, but then use it as a learning experience. Now, in friendship, some of the kids with Asperger's develop friendships through the special interest, like Minecraft. And it's very, very popular. And one of the things I've found, though, is when I'm dealing with the teenagers with Asperger's, and parents say, he's obsessed, addicted to his computer games. He's isolated. All he does is go to the screen. And I say, well, hang on a moment. What's he doing? Well, he's now playing the game on the internet. And because he's played the game so often, he's a master of his craft. And when he plays in a group, he's popular. He's the one they want in their group because he knows how to get past this, that, and the other. So for the first time in his life, when he plays the game on the internet, He's popular, he's successful, he's the guide or the mentor to all the others. And if he's made an arrangement to start a new game at 6 p.m., a mum says at 6 o'clock, it's mealtime, what does he do? He has a commitment to those in the group because at last he's valued. So be careful, it's not always social isolation. It can be a social interaction that's not conventional, you're not looking at people, you're not talking in that usual way that adults will expect, but it is social engagement. It's not always a purely solitary activity. Now, what you may do for the special interest is lunch and after school clubs based on the special interest, such as movie trivia. Okay, a lot of Aspies like movies, or computer games of the Minecraft group, or there's actually books now on Lego therapy. That is, you work as a team. One of you is the designer, another one is the finder of the pieces, another one is the one who puts them together, etc. So you work as a team and take turns in your roles, okay, as the site manager or project manager versus those that are the actual construction people and those who are the finders of the pieces that are missing. So you work together as a team for the creation of the final model. Now, the social curriculum for stage two is compliments. When do you give compliments? When do you receive them? How do you cope with them? So it's giving a compliment because they're becoming increasingly valuable now in friendships. And if you are going to criticize that it's done appropriately and constructively, Aspies are great at criticism. They're great at spotting errors. And if you as a parent or adult make an error, they are the first person to point out your mistake, and you should be grateful to them for your mistake being pointed out. <laughs> but they've got to learn in the group, zip it, okay? It's cooperation. How well do they contribute to the common goal rather than my way? I'll do it in my way, you do it your way. Accepting the rules of the game, but they are often of the policemen. They may not be good at ball sports, but they are brilliant at referees, linesmen, and um, umpires, because they know the rules and they impose the rules. Um, being patient, being aware of personal body space, appropriate touch, copes with mistakes themselves and others, copes with interruptions and doesn't interrupt too much, and gives encouragement. So these are the dimensions we're looking at. Again, if they do it naturally, thank them, point out what they did right. If they missed the cues, didn't read it, didn't respond as appropriate, then they need to learn how to do it. In conversation, it's keeping on track, that the same theme as everyone else is talking about, avoiding monologues, not easy for Aspies. Careful of literal interpretation. So when people say, pull your socks up, you think, well, okay, I'll put my socks up, but how's that gonna make me smarter? How is intelligence measured by the height of your socks? Um, speech, volume, um, and sense of humor. Oh, sometimes these kids have an amazing sense of humor, but. It's often their own sense of humor. 
Okay. Uh, conflict resolution. There's going to be conflict. Do they compromise? Do they avoid anger? Um, do they cope with situations that they perceive as unfair? And do they forgive? Sometimes for Aspies it's hard to forgive when somebody's broken the rules. So we again go through, do they do it, applaud it, if not, learn it, practice it. Empathy, recognizing the signals and words and gestures of support and affection, because in friendship now, there's an expectation that the friend will cheer you up, calm you down, reassure you. Is not possessive in the friendships, not liking their friend playing with anyone else, because the friend should always play with me, and if they make a mistake, the art of apology. Girls pick this up very quickly, as we boys need to learn it. Now, level three is nine to 13 years old. And that's our son, William, with three of his friends, with a spade. No idea why, because he's not a gardener. He was up to mischief. And if I'd have known what he was doing, I don't think I'd have allowed him out of the house. But being Aspie, there's the, at school, there's the good guys and the bad guys. Good guys, closed door, don't take risky people. Bad guys, always an open door, as long as you're stupid, risky, except that's the group he went to. Because... As I said, they're not really friends, they're setting you up, but they're my friends. If I don't have them, I've got no one. I'm a loser. They're taking advantage of you. They're making you say things to the teacher. They are making you do things. Go on, Will, go on, you do it. And their applause without him knowing what he was doing uh, on that. So, 9 to 13 years old. It's aware of others' opinions of them, and this is for typical kids, and how their words and actions affect their feelings. In other words, you learn a white lie. It's crap, but you say it's wonderful. Now, of course, this is a husband whose wife has bought a new skirt and says to her Aspie husband, do, 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 do you think I look fat in this? And then the husband says, no, 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 not fat, no, obese. <laughs> Definitely obese, because your body mass index is 32, which is morbidly obese, so you, 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 you look obese. What, what, why are you crying? We're supposed to be honest with each other, etc." And Aspies can't understand the concept of a white lie. You should be honest. You should be upfront. <laughs> but sometimes, no, you've got to say it's lovely when it's crap, uh, etc. Uh, now there's a need for companionship rather than functional play. Before, if there was an activity, a group of kids would combine to play that activity. Then another activity, another group will combine. Like a pack of cards, each card is a person. It's reshuffled for the new activity. Now... It's a family. It's a unit. It's a three, four, five group who play different activities together. They are learning, cooperation, cohesion. They're the first experience of a family unit outside the actual family. So what's happening here is it's a need for companionship rather than functional play. Those friendships may last a lifetime. It's cooperation more than competition and sharing thoughts rather than toys. It's self-disclosure. It's secrets. Now, this is a group who meet at each recess, who meet after school, who... Oh, dear, I'm going to jump on my soapbox now. When I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, I went out the house, and my mother would say, Anthony, be a long time. <laughs> anyway, right, OK. Thanks, Mother. Um, and we'd meet up, and we'd go around. Then when we were hungry... Uh, we'd go back for lunch, we'd have a quick lunch, fast as we could, out we go, till it was sunset, and then we'd come back. And we're on our own. In a group, we would learn conflict. We would learn, you know, somebody falls over on a rope. You know, you don't sue the rope company, you fell over and that's what you do. And, and we learn cohesion and so on. Now, kids, I, I go, when I, my wife and I go walking in this beautiful... Oh, kids! You think, where are the kids? We're in a suburban area. There should be kids out and about, on their bikes. No, they're all supervised and scared there's a paedophile behind every tree. You know, I was young. And it, anyway, it means that teachers today say kids in the present generation are developmentally younger than they were in years gone by because they spent less time free, not supervised, structured social activities. We just disappeared. And we learnt a lot of life. So... Um, sharing thoughts rather than toys. It's 
personality characteristics of a friend now. It's somebody who's audacious. It's somebody who has a good sense of humour. Helps when you're in emotional distress, cheers you up, calms you down. Uh, helps you feel good about yourself, gives you compliments. And there's a greater selectivity and durability in the friendships because your personality matching now rather than somebody who's good at ball sports or good at Minecraft. There's a strong gender split at this stage, 9 to 13. Boys play with boys and girls with girls. For typical kids, boys do not play with girls because if they play with girls, they get an infectious disease called cooties or girl germs and their penis falls off. <laughs> and girls will not play with boys because they're dirty, smelly and stupid, which is true, but never mind. Um, so they're separated. Of course, when they get to puberty, they can't keep their hands off each other. But at this stage, uh, completely different. What makes a good friend? Trust, loyalty, and keeping promises. Why are you so and so your friend? I can trust her with my secrets. Interestingly, with Aspies, you can trust with a secret. They're not into gossip. Now, there are resources. There's the Secret Agent Society, which is for this age group. They're now being introduced to whole school settings and therapists and parents using the programme. It's an animation with lots of games and activities which will go through friendship, bullying and teasing, emotion management and so on. So it's a new activity designed actually in Brisbane called the Secret Agent Society. And if you put that into a Google, you'll get the details. There are other books now, social skills groups for children, uh, um, a Jessica Kingsley publisher, and social skills programme. So I would say there are now several dozen books on friendship and Asperger's at the different stages of development. Uh, the friendship formula, Michelle Garcia winners, The Socially Curious and Curiously Social. So there's a variety of books. Um, Lorraine over at the bookstore will probably, if you've got a person in a particular age group, will tell you which books for that age group. There are a variety of books on friendship. Uh, this is one I've liked called Win or Lose by How You Choose, by Judge Judy. Now, I'm not recommending the Judge Judy show. This book is now out of print, but I'll give you an illustration. This is the scene. There he is with his dog, yes, and you can see something on the carpet. It was related to the dog a little while ago, and it's still warm. Now, you were visiting your friend, and your dog had an accident on the floor in his living room. You should, this is your judgment, as in Judge Judy. You should, A, clean it up and apologise. B, tell your friend about it. C, move a chair over it so that it can't be seen. Or D, take your dog and leave without saying anything. <laughs> of course, the answer is D. <laughs> You've probably got that scene that's occurring there. Your friends begin to make fun of your new neighbour because she has big ears. You should A, walk away from your friends and say nothing. Tell them to stop because it's unkind. Or suggest to your new neighbour she wears a hat to cover her ears or make fun of her too. Aspies do the practice. If you wore a hat, then they would laugh at you. <laughs> yep, OK. A, uh, but you see, in maths, there's a correct answer. In this, it's not obvious what the correct answer is and you can't prove it. Now, this scene. Kid on the right, quizzical look on his face. The salami sandwich that your mother prepared for you is missing from your lunchbox. Do you suspect one of your friends took it because he smells like salami? <laughs> you should A, ask him if he saw your sandwich, B, take his lunchbox and search it, C, steal his lunch, or D, tell him your sandwich smells like salami, but actually it's dog food. <laughs> and if he goes, then you know he's just eaten it. So it's making a bit of fun, but it, it is, in social situations, it's rare to have an absolutely correct answer. Now, remember I said compliments. Carl Gray and I looked at the idea of compliments important throughout life. And we thought, okay, for this age group and adults in particular, the value of compliments. We have to teach the kids the value of giving and receiving, how to receive compliments. But what works is logic, and we decided, OK, we'll do a social article, not a social story. This is for high school and above, including adults. And the logic is, how do compliments help? If you're on a sporting team, compliment between the members enhances cohesion, and that team is going to be more effective as a cohesive team to be successful. So we go through the logic. But then there's a question, what do you compliment about? For example, if you're complimenting me about my shirt, that's okay. 
favourite shirt, hasn't got a pocket, shame, but never mind, I'd say, yeah, I'm, I like it too, like the colour. But if you said, Tony, oh, you have such beautiful eyes. It depends on your gender as how I respond. <laughs> and what was sent as a compliment is embarrassing. Like the kid with Asperger's who was 14, sitting next to a girl in his class, very beautiful, and he looked at her face and said, oh, I wish I could grow a moustache like yours. <laughs> Didn't go down too well. <laughs> so it depends on what you compliment about. And it's <laughs> how you respond. So in, a, in our social article, which started off, we thought, as a two-page article, ended up as a 24-page manuscript, really. And when you get a, a compliment. Jenny said she likes my shirt. You could acknowledge, ah, acknowledge, oh, you like my shirt. Agree, I like it too. Or appreciate, thank you, or combine them. Ah, oh, thank you, you like my shirt. I like it as well, thank you. Are uh, combining all of them. But then there's the issue, not just what you compliment about and how do you respond, but how often. You see, if you give no compliments, people think you don't like them or you don't care. Um, or if you give too many, say to the boss at work, there's a description for that which is most unhygienic. <laughs> and I'll give you an illustration. Um, remember I said the phone call I had with my mother uh, about Bernard being Aspie? But later in the conversation I said, Mother, um, I've known Bernard for, at that stage, 54 years. And I said, in 54 years, I can't remember a compliment he has ever given me. And my mother went, no, he never has. His view was, if you know it's good, why should I have to say that? Okay. So it's the art of compliments, not only in a friendship, but in a family too. So what Carol Gray and I did was a... <laughs> This is Aspie. The suggested frequency for sincere compliments. This is the mathematical formula or algorithm for compliments. Now, if the recipient is a loved one, spouse, family member, boyfriend, girlfriend, or close friend, once or twice a day, tell your partner that you need a compliment twice a day. If it's a co-worker and friend, once or twice a week. Co-worker, not a friend, uh, maybe not this week or once a week, or a friend once or twice a week. Good ratios. Cal Gray and I were working on this document in Birmingham, England, my original hometown. And we were presenting together. Uh, I would present for 10 minutes. Carol would be at a table like this, working on the document. Uh, she would take over. I would read the document, make some comments. So it was a document in progress. Now in the break, line of people uh, was started to ask questions. At the head of that was Giesler. Now Giesler said, oh, my husband Chris, who works in information technology, um, has been diagnosed with Asperger's and she had a question and she saw the compliment guide and she looked at it and she went, oh, compliments. Oh, we've been married for five years and I can't think of a compliment he's ever given me. Not one in five years. She put it down and off she went. And Carol Gray and I went, went ooh, ooh. anyway, in the line was Chris, her husband. And, and he hadn't heard this. And he came up and he, he asked his question and we answered it. And he said, oh, compliment guide. He said, well, this is interesting. Nobody's, nobody's ever explained compliments to me before. I, I didn't know they were important. Well, I didn't know they were important in a relationship. I didn't think they were needed in a relationship. He said, can I borrow it? <laughs> to which Carol Gray and I said, yes, Chris, you need it. <laughs> now, this was in England. A few weeks later in London, the National Autistic Society organized in 1999 the world's first workshop for those who have a partner with Asperger's, and they asked me to facilitate it. Yeah. 35 women and me. Right. I didn't facilitate it. I just went, wow, as they talked about everything and really enjoyed the opportunity to be understood. But there was Giesler. And I said, in the break, Giesler. The compliment guide. Did it work? <gasps> Did it work? I get exactly two a day. <laughs> I 
I know it's contrived, but it's lovely still to get them. <laughs> anyway, I return to Australia, and a few weeks later, I get a, an email from Giesler uh, saying Chris had stopped complimenting her. He'd lost the booklet. <laughs> so she said, can you send me another one? Um, now, this is a, an article. Um, I'm just conscious that in a moment or two, we need some question time. Uh, what they decided to do, this is a, a, actually a study in Sydney, a uh, New South Wales study. Um, what they did was have eight 50-minute sessions for teenage peers of girls. This was a girls' school uh, that had a number of girls with ASD. And within the religious education classes of that Catholic school, from the seventh to the ninth grade, explaining Asperger's, improving knowledge, the strength of Asperger's, and how to interact with a peer with ASD helped enormously. Okay? So that was a way that I think some schools may need to do a program on that. Another program that I would like to have for this is high school monitors. So when I travel on Qantas, if the member of the cabin crew speaks a foreign language, they have as a badge the flag of that country. So if they speak Spanish, Spanish flag is there. If I'm Spanish, I'll know that person will understand me fluently. Great. What I want at high school is to identify kids who have a natural ability to understand Asperger's, either because they've got an Aspie sibling or they're naturally talented in that. And they have a badge, which may be a badge of a jigsaw puzzle shape, universal sign of ASD. But that is a person that the Aspie teenager can go to for advice and guidance socially, but can also monitor that person, step in when they're bullied and teased, etc., and monitor their degree of inclusion. Because when it comes to bullying and teasing, most of those actions are not witnessed by a teacher. So they're the ones that they can go to, that are aware of it, that they are Aspie friendly. Could be identified by a badge, monitor the integration and vulnerability, act as an advocate, and provide feedback to teachers. Now, adolescent to adult is interesting, but I may make an executive decision to focus on questions rather than that. But what I may do is just have a quick, ah, uh, uh, right. I think that's fairly straightforward. Uh, okay, no, I'll, I'll do it quickly. Okay, right. Um, that's me at university with friends. Look at the hair. Wow, amazing. We had lots of hair in those days. Which one? Oh, the one with the hat. Which one? <laughs> Which one? I suppose so. Have I changed that much? Okay, right. We've all changed. Now, um... Peer group acceptance is more important than the parents. Parents are past their use-by date. It's the value of the peer group to make or break self-esteem, finding somebody's character compatible to your own. Complex needs a friendship, but a friend is someone who accepts you for who you are. And the Aspies say, nobody's ever accepted me for who I am. They've always wanted me to be different from who I am and a clone of themselves. I must be defective. Uh, we need to find a friend who thinks the same way. At this stage, it's the use of humour. Some of the kids with Asperger's can learn that, but it's a common currency for, Aspie, uh, for typical adults. It's also going through um, organising a social occasion. Often these kids say, oh, no, I, can't, I can't phone somebody up, I can't organise something, I'm too shy. Somebody may need to be social secretary. But it's also peer pressure and exploitation. Uh, sometimes I am very concerned how... Teenagers and adults will abuse, in all senses, the person with Asperger's syndrome. Um, it's a sense of loneliness, of being distant. But it's animals as friends and internet friends in those games. Sometimes using drama classes at the upper end of high school, that is learning how to act and that drama class, because as far as that teenager is concerned, I don't want to join a friendship group because they'll tease me because I haven't got any friends. But if you have a drama group that's doing the art of conversation and things like that, not Shakespearean plays, that is a socially peer acceptable way of learning social skills. So it's observing somebody as a good, we hope, role model. But one teenager said, life's a stage. Yeah, it is for me. It's as though I'm on stage, I'm a play, and 
everyone else in the play knows the scripts, knows the line, know what everyone's going to say, but I've got no script. And I say what I think is the next line in this play, and they all laugh at me. I'm in a play without a theme, without a script. That's my life. I've never seen the script. Um, and finally, before we do questions, this is why some of the teenagers with Asperger's have found the cure. Yeah, you can cure ASD. It's dead easy, actually. It's not medication. It's not psychotherapy. It can be done at home. Dead easy. Many Aspies have discovered it. Remember at the beginning I did the diagnostic criteria? You can dissolve all the diagnostic criteria by taking your child, adolescent, to their bedroom. And you place them in their bedroom, and you walk out, close it off, and he's cured. Because you can't have a problem with social and emotional reciprocity if there's no one to be reciprocal with. You can't have a problem reading body language and facial expressions if there's nobody there with you. You can't have a problem making and maintaining friends if there's no one there. All your autism and Asperger's dissolves in solitude. You can have routines and rituals, there's no sensory sensitivity, all the other components have gone. You are cured. Not only are you cured in your bedroom, but you're also not with toxic teenagers who bully and tease you and are bad for your mental health. You can do what you want to do. The problem is the moment they walk out of that bedroom. And as soon as they are with other people, that's when their problems arise. Two's company, three's a crowd. And the degree of stress is proportional to the number of people present. So that's why quite a few teenagers don't want to leave their bedroom. Because life is so toxic. So we have to make it a success. Otherwise, they will find their own cure. Okay. Finally, pretending to be normal by Leanne holiday Willie. Um, looking far over my shoulder, I can call to mind people who must have been interested in my friendship. I can see a boy I knew as if it was yesterday. I can hear conversations we had and interests we shared. She's now in her 40s. But more important, I can remember his face and the expressions he made as we talked. Today, if he looked at me like he did then, I believe I would have seen the kindness and gentleness that was his. I never did much with this boy when I had the chance. I missed his offer of friendship. I would not miss that offer if it was made today. His face would make sense to me today. Better late than never. And some can finally get it. But it may be in the adult years that they have finally acquired the degree of social uh, knowledge, cohesion, and acceptance. So that can occur at the end. Now, I'm aware that I've got about 15 minutes for questions. I know. Have we got any more questions from people on the internet? Because I'm going to go through those first. And then ask people here, everyone. OK. This is from Yellow Ladybugs. And I know who that is. But, OK. She says, how can teachers support girls at mainstream school during recess lunch? I think give them choices. If they feel brave and they have enough energy to socialize, great. But if they want to go to the library or they want to be in the classroom, they have an opportunity to gain a sanctuary and solitude that's safe to be away from the others. Because they need that time in solitude for their cup to drain, which drains slowly in solitude, so they can go back into the classroom and cope with the social side. Another thing is that I talked about is those monitors, that is that there are people, spies in the camp, or the monitors, who are able to observe what's happening when the teachers aren't present at recess, if they are targeted, rejected, and bullied and teased, step in and stop it. More on that in the afternoon. It may be to organize clubs for those who are interested in the Minecraft or whatever it is, so she has an opportunity to meet other people. So what's more important is that the social is successful. Just saying, go out and play, and if you haven't got any friends, you should just try harder, doesn't really work. Okay? Now, another one. What's the best approach for early teen girls who refuse school, both group and homeschooling? Mm. Won't come out of their bedrooms. 
That's what I've just been talking about. She's found the cure. As far as she's concerned, life is safe in solitude. In other words, I am not sure if I'm good enough for schoolwork. I hate it when I get wrong. It gives me a headache. I'm not very good at it. I'm not good at socialising. I prefer solitude and what I do indoors. So, um, it's really working on the special interest as the connection that may be woven into the curriculum. It may be done as a reward for doing things. It may be as a way of making friends, unlike-minded people. The problem is that once that person is marooned in their bedroom, if it's there for several months or years, it's very resistant to change. So that's why when they go home at, at the end of grade 12, as soon as they finish grade 12, parents must start volunteer work, college, or whatever, as fast as possible. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard for them to get out and doing things that they need to do. So it's really finding out. We need an assessment of what is it about the schoolwork, the socialising, that means that you are safer on your own than not only to improve the skills, but also to have supported practice of coming out of your shell with confidence and success. Now, another one. Diagnosed late last year, my 13-year-old is attending psych appointments, but she refuses to acknowledge or discuss the diagnosis. What can I do to help? Yeah, she's not mad. So she doesn't want to see a shrink. And she also knows if she sees a shrink, it's a reason the other kids torment and tease. If she's 13... It's the power of the peer group to make or break self-esteem. No matter how good the psych is, she knows if she's labelled as mad, bad, psychotic, or whatever it is, that's going to be torn to shreds by her peer group. So at this stage, you don't use the A word. You start working on personality. That's what young teenagers are doing, is exploring the concept of personality of my own, other people, what matters. So we go through, you're the sort of person who socialises for a while, then exhausts it. We need to make sure that the social occasions you have are brief, successful, then you can leave. You're the sort of person who has very strong feelings of anxiety and worry. We need to work on this. So we go through, you are the sort of person who, rather than a diagnostic label, and going through those components, but also, there are some self-help books that she can work on with a parent, perhaps a friend, or with someone she can go through without feeling that people are thinking me of me as mad. Okay? That can be a major problem for the person when they see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. They view, well, I'm either mad or they're going to use medication. I don't like medication because I can't think straight and it doesn't do me any good and I don't want to be labelled I think that person is having an understandable resistance to that. It also means with psychologists and psychiatrists, those with ASD are very quick in determining whether they like you or not. Same with teachers. And they make that decision within 10 seconds of meeting you. And sometimes it's great and sometimes it's a disaster. And if it won't work, it'll never work. There's just something about that person that doesn't seem to connect. What we do find, though, is, and I don't know whether you can do that here, but at Minds and Hearts, we have girl groups, all Aspie girls, for friendship or feelings or sense of self, called the Being Me group. And what I find is the girl with Asperger's accepts and accommodates the advice of her peers more than a parent or professional. And what has astounded me is the wisdom of the advice of fellow Aspis. As in the book, uh, been there, done that, try this. But that's more for adults. So we find in the group, it's the peer group that have much more power to encourage that person to be successful, to feel that they are not judged by that group, and they can come back to the group the next week and tell of their successes of what they've done. And if it didn't work out, that group's not going to go, Burr, or how long are you going to keep, etc., as a parent may do. They are very supportive because they understand. So what she may need is to meet other 
Aspie girls as potential friends, and substitute psychologists. Now remember, observation, analysis, and imitation, but some grow up to be psychologists and psychiatrists. Yes, they do. And one of my colleagues, Rachel, is a psychotherapist. She has Asperger's syndrome. She's an excellent psychotherapist, takes one to no one in terms of Asperger's, but she has great credibility because she's been through it. She's had all the bullying and the teasing and the horrendous circumstances, but she knows, and the Aspens know, she knows. She's not just being compassionate, she's been there, she's felt it, so she has far more credibility. Okay, now, other questions from anyone? Lady in the front, have we got a microphone or no? What I may do for those on the internet is I will repeat the question, but we do have a microphone on its way. Thank you. I have a, um, a non-verbal own agenda preschooler. I just wondered if you had any sort of tips on introducing socialisation that weren't too stressful or confronting for him. Uh, how old is he? Four and a half. Four and a half. Okay, I think socially two's company, three's a crowd. So it's really one-on-one -on -one, uh, in that setting. And what you may do is a little bit of rehearsal with an adult of what games, what to do, etc. And it may be that the initial stages of he's playing and doing this with an adult, and then the other kid joins so that he has the security that there's an adult there who knows when to step back and knows when to engage. Afterwards, give positive feedback of what they did, makes note of what needs to be worked on, etc. But it's really one-on-one -on -one with an adult, then one-on-one -on -one with the adult watching of practicing what to do. But it's finding out what would be the types of games and activities he'd like to do. And then trying to find someone who likes the same sort of stuff and then engage. So you may say to the typical kid here, um, Jacob likes to, and I know you're not keen on it, but for the sake of Jacob, could we have a go? Okay, because he'd like to play this game. So it needs to be a game he likes, feels comfortable with initially with another kid and then say, it's called Fair's Fair, you've played a game of, okay, what you do is you then say to the your friend, what would you like to play? And then we'll play that game. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, another, it's easier for the people at the front, but then we've got two people over there. So we'll have one there and then over there. Hi, I have a 15-year-old non-verbal daughter and um, I'm currently teaching her about adaption. Um, I was wondering, how can you teach a teenager to adapt when circumstances change in your family um, circumstances and how to help them understand what has happened? Okay, you mentioned one of the most difficult words and concepts of those with ASD to cope with. It's called change. Yeah. And in ASD, there's an aversion to change. The person likes routine, consistency, and predictability. When they wake up in the morning, they have the plan for the day. <laughs> but they haven't got a plan B. Now, the other thing that can occur with change is not just the change in routine, etc., but it's emotionality. Remember I said that if that change may cause negative emotions in others, then they're going to pick it up and explode. Even if the person's nonverbal, they're going to do that as a fine art. They will be able to be sensitive to it. What is needed is knowing, and if the person is, has classic autism, is using picture format what we're doing so that they can see the sequence of the day and what's occurring, and that gives a sense of reassurance. It also means that with change, there will probably be a temporary increase in ASD characteristics. So it's not a deterioration. It's basically coping with the changes in routine and predictably till a new routine occurs. But we'll use pictorial systems of understanding the sequence of the day, but also knowing that that change is going to cause a lot of stress. So they may need more solitude, physical activities, whatever it is, as stress management of coping with that change. And it's going to take a while before that change is accommodated. So it's got to be done very carefully. Yeah? For ASD, variety is not the spice of life. It's something that the person wants routine and consistency. And 
it also occurs in psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is based on the concept that you can change, whereas the person with ASD thinks life will always be like this, but you can change the way you perceive it. That's what psychotherapy is all about. Okay. Now, there's some... Ah, yes. Okay. okay. Um, I've got a, a son who is 12. He has ASD, and he also has double deficit dyslexia. Uh, what suggestions would you have for supporting a student in a middle school environment? Okay, so he's 12-year-old with ASD with dyslexia. Yeah, severe. Severe. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, as I said earlier, what's valuable at school? Social skills, sporting, or intelligence. Now, at primary school, um, you don't need reading that much. But when you're 12 in high school, you need to read. And what will hurt him is some of those who aren't as smart as he is are better and able to read and do it without second thoughts. Now, he needs... Do, do, do you know what are the origins of his dyslexia? Uh, it's genetic. It's genetic? Yeah. Okay. Um, he's going to need a thorough assessment to find out what's occurring. I'll go through some of the things that I found help. Uh, Erlen lenses and overlays I found pretty useful because that has stabilised the image and the coloured lenses, so behavioural optometrist. Maybe it's worth a try for Erlen lenses. Have you tried them? Um, <clears throat> I have opinions about that. <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily evidence-based, as far as I'm aware. And also, um, I know the whole multi-sensory approach works for him. Um, so he has been profiled through the Australian Dyslexic Association. Okay. Um, but I, I find that because he is very clever, so the frustration from the ASD is coming from the... Oh, yeah. the ASD means he, he won't be able to cope with it emotionally very well. Yeah. And he'll see it as a personal insult, and I'm stupid, and I'm bad, yeah. why should I do it? And if you don't try, you don't make a mistake. Yeah. So it will inhibit his learning in certain areas where reading is minimal, but he'll have a, be turned off a lot of the academic activities. Yeah. And so that's a difficulty. Um, I can only recommend very detailed assessment, but I'll give you an illustration that I found for one of the reasons for reading difficulties, which is not a typical dyslexic characteristic of perception, but is to do with perception. Okay. I was doing a diagnostic assessment of an adult in his 30s. Confirmation of the diagnosis was clear. I was photocopying some articles for him to read between then and the next session, and as the pages were coming off the photocopy, he said, something there, Tony, could you choose a page? I went, yep. He said, can you choose a paragraph in the middle of the page? OK. Choose a word in the middle of that paragraph. Yep. He said, right. As you look at that word, how many words either side are in your visual field? I said, oh, one word either side. He said, yes. You read in a three-word chunk. He said, for me, it's three letters. So it's like taking a page of print and a car piece of cardboard with a hole in it for the width of three letters, and that's how he reads or tries to read. It's a very narrow visual field. It's what psychologists call weak central coherence. In that narrow field, it's the visual acuity of an eagle, but it's very, very narrow. So you need to check what his visual field is. So it's really looking at the perceptual aspects, the linguistic aspects, etc., but I would work on his self-esteem as a counterbalance to that. Because if you can't repair the reading skill, he's got to have a sense of self by his personality or other attributes that are independent of reading and boost those. So although you may spend time on improving his reading skills, yes, to get them to a hopefully a certain level, but he's likely to have skills in other areas if you can increase those it's a good counterbalance and antidote to low self-esteem. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, two, two people there. Is it the same question or different? Because we are supposed to finish at 12.30 and it's just gone. Okay, one more question. Um, apart from time, can you give me some tips to strengthen my relationship with my son? He doesn't like a fiction. Oh, um, 
as far as the kids with ASD are concerned, um, it's not a hug, it's a squeeze. And why are you squeezing me? And how does squeezing me solve the problem? And so when they're young, they learn, don't cry, because if you cry, people squeeze you. And as far as he's concerned, I don't get it. As one eight-year-old said, I fail to understand why exerting pressure on the human body should be considered relaxing. <laughs> it was eight! <laughs> and uh, by chance, Michelle Garnett and I have actually written a book on this, which I hope Lorraine may have, because it's understanding the need. I, have, I, I say to the kids and the adults, husbands, I say, you have to feel sorry for neurotypicals. They're such fragile flowers. They have to be told they're loved and hugged every day. Yes, they do. You are a cactus with a prickly exterior to protect a vulnerable interior. But as far as a cactus needs one cup of rain, one hug a month, and you're OK, your mum is a rose in a rose garden. And she needs to be touched and mulched and told she's loved every day. Otherwise, she wilts and dies. Yep, she does. What a shame. It's her vulnerability. But <laughs> we say, look, if you give her lots of hugs, she'll give you lots of presents. <laughs> Uh, and we go through. We do a social story. In other words, he needs to know the signals of when affection is needed, but also how to respond. You've got to be careful, because for some of the kids, there can be a tactile defensiveness, or also a difficulty resonating with or responding to love and affection. It can even be compliments. Sometimes the kids are very sensitive to compliments. It's almost as though other people's happiness, euphoria, or positive moods, they can't cope with. So there's a narrow tolerance. Negative moods, just a little bit, don't like it. But I don't like affection beyond a certain level. And it's confusing, and I can't resonate with it, and I find it aversive, and I don't want it. So it's going through in the book, um, for parents, we go through, how old is he? Eight. Nine. Ah, he's just the right age. We go through, it's five sessions or five sets of activities to specifically work on why do humans need hugs and affection, how to give them, how to respond to them, and we have little assignments and things like that for the person to do, but to realize that hugs can be quite valuable. As far as he's concerned, he's not rejecting you, it's just an expression that he may find difficult not only to cope with or know how to respond. Okay? When I do the diagnostic assessment, I'll say to the child, I want to tell you a story, a pretend story of you coming home. And I want you to imagine that you come home from school, you walk into the kitchen, and there's your mum at the kitchen table. She's got her back to you. And you say, hi, mum. And she turns around. And as she turns around, you notice she's crying. She's so sad. Now, nothing to do with you, but she's so sad. What would you do? And the kids will say, I'd ask her what's wrong. Excellent, because you need to know what's wrong. But what could you do or say that would make her feel better? Uh, I, I, I do the washing up. Uh, I do my homework. Uh, I talk about the Titanic. Yes, because it makes you happy, doesn't it? <laughs> so you think it makes mum happy. I'd, I'd tell her a joke. Uh, I'd make her a cup of tea. I'd put her to bed. I'll get that. I'll leave her alone. She'll get over it quicker. <laughs> that tells me what works for him. And what works for him is what he's doing. Okay? So if you don't know what's missing, you might need a diagnostic assessment. So we assume you know what's missing. So it's needing to explore. It's almost as though affection has been perceived as aversive and confusing and best not to do it. So what's interesting with the book that we've written on that topic is, yes, parents buy it. So do a lot of couples for their husbands, so that they can understand when to give affection, and so on. OK, now, um, some, most of you, who won't be here this afternoon? Oh, what a shame. <laughs> you should be here. Right, OK, I quit at this stage. See you back at uh, whatever time the afternoon session starts. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.